Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming FBI Director Christopher Wray and Attorney General William Barr. Well, morning, thank you all for being here. This summit's sessions address part of a critical area facing law enforcement today, technology's impact on society and in particular on our public safety. You know, we all live so much of our lives online that it can be easy to take that for granted. An awful lot that's important to us can be accessed through the internet. And of course, it's increasingly where we connect with other people, but we're constantly reminded that that same technology that facilitates free speech connects us with our loved ones and our friends and enriches our lives can pose serious dangers. As our use of technology grows in fast evolving and exciting ways, so does criminal use of technology. Technology connects spreaders of hate speech with vulnerable people who can be moved to violent action and attack connects predators with children, illicit drug producers with addicts, terrorists with inspiration and training. And the criminals stalking the internet are constantly evolving, growing in sophistication. Like much other infrastructure that we rely on to keep our communities and economy running, the internet, from its physical underpinnings to the large online platforms we interact with, is largely in private hands. Currently, that leaves vital public safety questions in the hands of private corporations. Will they build platforms that ensure they can identify victims of child, sexploit, child sexpo, sexual exploitation to stop abuse? Will they help guard our elections against malign foreign influence? These are vital societal questions with impacts for families all across America far beyond any company's bottom line. Let me be clear, we have to ensure that our businesses can continue to innovate. Their creativity is one of our country's greatest strengths. But we know that we can have both a spirited entrepreneurial internet and safe, secure online and real world flesh and blood communities. We can solutions to the dangers we face while supporting our industries by working together. Those of us in government and law enforcement, the victims advocacy community, and the tech industry have the combined power, the ability, and the skill to tackle the challenges that evolving technology presents. So this is a great time to be having this discussion we've gathered for this morning, thinking about what we need to do together to protect the American people as we look to the future. At the FBI, we're grateful to be standing shoulder to shoulder with our DOJ colleagues in these efforts. And today, I'm honored to introduce a leader whose experience with law enforcement, the justice system, and the regulatory arena will help us continue to drive towards solutions. Attorney General Bill Barr has served our country twice as Attorney General, our 77th and now our 85th. He is no stranger to tackling challenges. During his first tenure as Attorney General, he faced the savings and loans crisis, oversaw the investigation of Pan Am 103 bombing, directed the successful response to the Talladega prison uprising and hostage taking, and coordinated counterterrorism activities during the first Gulf War. Name a few items. Now he's working relentlessly to curtail violent crime on our streets, combat anti-Semitism and other dangerous extremism, and protect the 5G telecommunications networks that will help our economy move forward in the years to come. His DOJ service bookends deep experience in the private sector, leading legal, regulatory, and government affairs activities for Verizon. He's advised major corporations on government enforcement and regulatory litigation matters. So he's seen both the private and the public sector sides of daunting challenges. We need that type of strong leadership and true partnership across all sectors 
to confront the threats we face today, and the threats we'll face five and 10 and 20 years from now. So without further delay, let's give a warm welcome to my friend, the Attorney General, Bill Barr. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better partner, and, and I deeply appreciate your leader in these critical issues that are pressing in on us today. Uh, and I want to thank you for hosting our workshop today in this uh, great FBI space. It's a better space than we have over at Maine Justice, so I may be using it, calling on you to use it more. Um, Section 230 is a topic uh, that has garnered significant attention over the past year, and, and we're pleased to have so many experts and, and thought leaders uh, here with us today on panels uh, and in the audience. The Department of Justice's interest in Section 230 arose in the course of our broader review of uh, mar market-leading uh, online platforms, which we announced uh, last summer. While our efforts to ensure competitive markets through antitrust enforcement and policy are critical, we recognize that not all of the concerns raised about online platforms squarely fall within antitrust. These concerns are often complex and multidimensional, and so we're taking a holistic approach in considering how the department should act in protecting our citizens and society in this sphere. A driving motivation behind our broader perspective uh, of online platforms, including Section 230, is the need for the department's enforcement efforts to keep up with rapid changing technology. Technolo technological change over the past few decades has led to groundbreaking innovations and tremendous benefits to our economy and to consumers. At the same time, as the director uh, mentioned, criminals and bad actors now use this technology to facilitate and expand the scope of their wrongdoing and their victimization of our fellow citizens. The department has the responsibility to keep up with changes in technology to protect our citizens from these new harms, while at the same time preserving the benefits of this technology. Now, the Internet has evolved significantly since Section 230 was passed in 1996. At that time, almost 25 years ago, immunity was seen as vital to protecting new technology in its incipiency. Today, online platforms have become essential to Americans' daily lives, often serving as the primary conduit for how we receive and share information. No longer are tech companies the underdog upstarts. They have become titans of U.S. industry. Given this changing technological landscape, valid questions have been raised on whether Section 230's broad immunity is still necessary, at least in its current form. The increased size and power of online platforms has also left consumers with fewer options. The lack of feasible alternatives is relevant in the Section 230 discussion, both for those citizens who want safer online spaces and for those whose speech has been banned or restricted by these platforms. In enacting Section 230, Congress noted that the Internet offers a, quote, forum for a true diversity of political discourse, unique opportunities for cultural development, and myriad avenues for intellectual activity. Over time, however, the avenues for sharing information and engaging in discourse have concentrated in the hands of a few key players. Further, the big tech platforms of today often monetize through targeted advertising and related businesses rather than charging users. 
Thus, their financial incentives and content distribution may not always align with what is best for the user. While the Department's antitrust review is looking at these developments from the perspective of competition, we must also recognize that this what this concentration means for Section 230 immunity. The online platforms have changed not only in size, but also in substance. The early days of online public bulletin boards like AOL have been replaced by platforms with sophisticated content moderation tools, algorithms, recommendation features, and targeting. With these new tools, the line between passively hosting third-party speech and actively curating and promoting speech starts to blur. What these changes mean for the scope of Section 230 immunity is another important issue to consider. Technology has changed in ways that no one, including the drafters of Section 230, could have imagined. These changes have been accompanied by an expansive interpretation of Section 230 by the courts, seemingly stretching beyond the statute's text and original purpose. For example, defamation is Section 230's paradigmatic application, but Section 230 immunity has been extended to a host of additional conduct, from selling illegal and faulty products, to connecting terrorists, to facilitating child exploitation. Online services also have invoked immunity even where they solicit, solicited or encouraged unlawful conduct, shared in illegal proceeds, or helped perpetrators hide from law enforcement. The court's broad interpretation of Section 230 also occurs against the background of the Supreme Court in 1997, striking down every other provision of the CDA on First Amendment grounds. This left in place the unbalanced statutory regime that preserves technology providers' uh, te te liability protections, their immunity, without guaranteeing corresponding protections for minors from harmful material on the Internet. The Department of Justice is concerned about the expansive reach of Section 230 immunity. But we are not here to advocate a position yet. Rather, we are here to convene a discussion that will help us examine Section 230 and its impact in further detail. As we consider these issues, however, I would like to make a few observations preliminarily. First, Civil tort law can act as an important complement to our law enforcement efforts. Federal criminal prosecution is powerful, but necessarily it's a limited tool that addresses only the most serious conduct. The threat of civil liability, however, can create industry-wide pressure and incentives to promote safer environments. In fact, Congress has enacted civil laws specifically to supplement criminal enforcement. For example, the Anti-Terrorism Act provides civil redress for victims of terrorist attack on top of the criminal terrorism laws. Yet judicial construction of Section 230 has severely diminished the reach of this civil tool. Civil liability can work hand in hand with the Department's law enforcement efforts to promote a safer environment, both online and in the physical world. Second, broad Section 230 immunity can pose challenges for us, the Department, the FBI, and other federal agencies in certain civil enforcement matters. Actions brought in the public interest by the federal government do not raise the same concerns of mass liability for private speech torts that were at the core of Congress's concern when it enacted Section 230. It is questionable whether Section 230 was intended to allow companies to invoke the statute's immunity against the federal government acting to protect American citizens. Finally and importantly, Section 230 immunity is relevant to our efforts to combat 
lawless spaces online. We are concerned that internet services under the guise of Section 230 can not only block access to law enforcement, even when we have secured court-authorized warrants, but also prevent victims from civil recovery. This would leave victims of child exploitation, terrorism, human trafficking, and other predatory conduct, conduct without any legal recourse. <clears throat> Giving broad immunity to platforms that purposefully blind themselves and law enforcement to illegal conduct on their, uh, on their services does not create incentives to make the online world safer for children. In fact, it may do just the opposite. In addressing the myriad of online harms today, we must remember that the goal of firms is to maximize profit, while the mission of the government is to protect American citizens and society. Sometimes private incentives will create an optimal solution, such as the free market's ability to determine the price of a product. Where it comes to issues of public safety, the government is the one that must act on behalf of society at large. Law enforcement cannot delegate our obligations to protect the safety of the American people purely to the judgment of profit-seeking private firms. We must shape the incentives for companies to create a safer environment, which is what Section 230 was originally intended to do. The question for us and for this workshop is whether those incentives are working or whether they need to be recalibrated. These are just a few perspectives as we get, it gets started, but the goal for the department today is to listen. The concerns regarding Section 230 are many and not all the same. We must also recognize the benefits that Section 230 and technology has brought to our society and ensure that the proposed cure is not worse than the disease. The debate, however, is important. To that end, we have brought together a diverse set of perspectives in both our panels and in our audience. We look forward to the discussion today and to continuing that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ray and Attorney General William Barr. If you'll indulge us for a minute, we're going to set up for the first panel, which should start in just a few minutes.
litigating Section 230, moderated by Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General Claire Murray. Thanks so much for being here, everyone, for what promises to be a fascinating panel and hopefully a very fruitful workshop. I'd like to start by introducing our distinguished panelists. We have a, a diverse group, in term, including two um, sort of leading scholars in the area of Section 230, and then three practitioners, one defense side and two plaintiff side, who have extensive experience litigating Section 230. Um, so just starting to my immediate left, Jeff Kossoff is an assistant professor of cybersecurity law in the United States Naval Academy's Cyber Science Department and the author of the book, The 26 Words That Created the Internet, The History of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Jeff previously practiced cybersecurity, privacy, and First Amendment law and clerked for Judge Mylon Smith of the Ninth Circuit and Judge Leonie Brinkema of the Eastern District of Virginia. And before becoming a lawyer, Jeff was a journalist for the Oregonian. To his left, Ben Sapersky, professor of law at Fordham Law School, where he is one of the nation's leading tort law scholars. He has written extensively on the interpretation of the Communications Decency Act and has served on executive committees of the jurisprudence and the defamation and privacy sections of the Association of American Law Schools. Before teaching, Ben practiced law and clerked for Judge Kimba M. Wood of the Southern District of New York. Right here in the middle, Pat is a partner at Wilmer Hale here in Washington, where he represents major media and entertainment companies. Pat is especially well known for his defense of social media companies in cases raising First Amendment and other free speech issues. His current and past clients in the tech space include Twitter, Facebook, Google, AOL, Craigslist, Airbnb, Yahoo, and the Internet Association. To Pat's left is Carrie Goldberg. Carrie is the founder and owner of the victims' rights law firm C.A. Goldberg PLLC in Brooklyn, New York. She is an expert in representing the victims of revenge porn and online abuse. Carrie is the author of Nobody's Victim, Fighting Psychos, Stalkers, Pervs, and Trolls, which received the 2019 New York Times Editor's Choice Award. And last but not least, on the end, Annie McAdams is the founder of Annie McAdams PC in Houston, Texas. Annie's firm exclusively represents victims nationwide who've been harmed due to the negligence or acts of others. Um, Annie has significant experience litigating Section 230 and is currently the lead trial counsel in high-profile sex trafficking cases against fi Facebook, Salesforce, and MailChimp. I'll just do kind of a little bit of um, kind of table setting before turning things over to our panelists. Um, you know, in, in the immortal words of Justice Kagan, we are all textualists now. So why don't we start with the text of 230. Um, as this kind of august group knows, Section 230 is really two parts of the same provision, both of which were enacted as part of the CDA in 1996. Um, the, the, the first provision, or the first you know, sub-provision, um, which is more famous and more litigated, um, is codified at Section 230C1, and the, the text of that provides no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. And basically, almost every phrase there could be unpacked or litigated and has been. So what is an interactive computer service? Who is a provider? Who is a user? What does it mean to be treated as a publisher or speaker? <laughs> is this better? No. <laughs> Unless it was calibrated for the TV. So, um, so I will just speak much louder. <laughs> so uh, what I was saying was that almost every phrase in, in the CDA can, or in, in Section 230 can be and has been litigated. So who is a provider? Who is a user? What does it mean to be, quote, the publisher or speaker? Um, what is an information content provider? The, the second portion of Section 230, um, Section 230C2, provides... No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. You know, that raises questions like what does it mean to take down content in good faith? Um, what do we mean by otherwise objectionable? So I guess we'll turn first to Jeff. Jeff, to understand some of those questions, can you take us back to 1996? How did those 26 words um, and resulting immunity come about? What, what's the kind of enactment history there? 
Great. And um, thanks so much for having me. And I have to first give a disclaimer. Uh, everything I say today is only my viewpoint. I'm not representing the DOD, Department of Navy, Naval Academy, nobody, uh, just myself. And you'll see why in a little bit. But I do have some midshipmen here with me. They're identifiable in standard dress blues. Say hi to them. Uh, they had to miss class for this. Um, <laughs> I also just wanted to really thank the Department of Justice for having this event. Um, one thing that can frustrate people who work in Section 230 quite a bit is that the debate over the past year has had some misinformation in it. And uh, it's due to a real lack of a good factual record because Section 230 has not really been the subject of much attention until the past few years. So efforts such as this to really have a dialogue and build a record about such an important law are really vital to having an informed debate. So I want to thank the DOJ for that. Uh, and now to go into what I was going to talk about, which is the history of Section 230. And the fun thing about the history of Section 230 is that you have to go way back before the development of even the early commercial internet. And you start with cases in the 1950s involving bookstores. Um, bookstores that were uh, being prosecuted under uh, mainly local ordinances for distributing obscene materials. And uh, one of these ordinances... Professor, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm told by the technical people that you should speak right into the microphone, and that'll help amplify it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> this better? Okay. So one of these ordinances goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. What the Supreme Court says is that the ordinance is invalid because it was strict liability. It imposed liability on a bookseller for selling obscene material regardless of whether the bookstore owner had any knowledge. And uh, what the Supreme Court said is that chills speech to such a degree to expect someone who's distributing someone else's speech to review every single word and image and make a determination. What the Supreme Court did not say was whether what the standard is to meet the First Amendment scrutiny. So uh, lower courts for the next 30 years in cases involving bookstores that were distributing um, defamatory materials, uh, obscene materials, they came up with a, uh, or the courts came up with a rule that basically said uh, generally the, the distributor has to either know or have reason to know of the illegal material to be held liable. And that worked pretty well for the next 30 years or so until we got to the early 90s and we had these early online services, CompuServe and Prodigy. And if you have, for those of us of a certain age, if you ever wanna feel really old, talk to college students about CompuServe and Prodigy. <laughs> and most of them were not born when they existed, but uh, they, they were mainly at first closed networks where they would connect users to chat rooms and bulletin boards and so forth. And not surprisingly, both CompuServe and Prodigy got sued for third-party content that was allegedly defamatory. Uh, CompuServe was the first to get sued, and it didn't do very much moderation. Uh, so what the court did was it dismissed the case and said, the reason we're dismissing the case is because you're like the electronic version of a newsstand. And a newsstand can only be liable if it knows or have, has reason to know of the illegal content. There's no allegation you did, so the case is dismissed. Prodigy gets sued a few years later, interestingly by uh, the guy who Jonah Hill's character is based on in Wolf of Wall Street, but that's a whole other story. Um, and <coughs> Prodigy had a different approach to user content. Prodigy wanted to be a family-friendly service, so it would uh, moderate, so it moderated content. It had contract moderators, a lot of user policies, and it asked the court to hold that it also was a distributor. And the court rejected this. This was a New York State trial court, and they said, no, because you exercise editorial control, you're more like a publisher, so you can be just as liable as the person who posted the content. And this really, this was 1995. And it started to get a lot of media coverage because it created this perverse incentive where if you actually took steps to restrict content that you believed was harmful, you could actually face more liability. And to frame sort of the social context at the time, this was right as children were starting to access the internet. Uh, schools were starting to have internet access. And there was a real concern that children would access pornography. 
So um, Congress paid attention to this, and at the time, Congress was overhauling the telecom laws for the first time in 60 years. So in the Senate, a group of senators introduced the Communications Decency Act, which imposed <coughs> fairly significant criminal penalties for the transmission of indecent content. Uh, and they attached that to their telecommunicate, their version of the telecom bill. Uh, the House uh, generally was more tech friendly, it had some younger members, and uh, it really, the House did not like what the Senate was doing. Uh, Speaker, Speaker Gingrich called it unconstitutional, and uh, you had a bipartisan pair of House members, Republican Chris Cox and Democrat Ron Wyden, who introduced the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act, which is essentially what became Section 230. And we just went over the text, basically the two main provisions, C1 and C2. And uh, there are exceptions for, there have always been exceptions for uh, intellectual property and federal criminal law within Section 230, that's as it was proposed. And then when it got to conference, in sort of a really fun uh, political maneuvering, both Section 230 and the Communications Decency Act were included in the final version of the Telecom Act. And they kind of conflicted with one another, and it wasn't clear how they would work together, but that ended up not really mattering because the Supreme Court would then strike down the Communications Decency Act. So we're left with Section 230. Uh, so that's what we have in 1996, 1997, but really in those early days, it was not entirely clear what it meant to say that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Does it mean that they shall not be treated as the publisher or speaker, that then they can be treated as the distributor and therefore can be liable if they know or have reason to know? Or is distributor just one type of publisher which would provide much stronger protection? And uh, we wouldn't really get clarity on that for a few years until uh, Pat would litigate really the, fir the first case that would go to a federal appellate court, uh, Zarin versus AOL. And I think we'll... So I think that's a over yes. to me <laughs> to talk about yes. uh, the Zaran case. So Zaran really is, it, is, is a garden variety Section 230 case, in, uh, but it was the first one, and it was decided by, uh, in the Fourth Circuit by uh, Judge Harvey Wilkinson, and it was also decided by Judge T.S. Ellis in the Eastern District of Virginia, and both judges ruled that AOL uh, 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 won the case based on Section 230 immunity. Just a little bit of background on the case. So uh, Ken Zaran, the plaintiff, was... Uh, just a, an individual out in Seattle uh, who, for reasons that are to this day unknown, was the subject of an extremely cruel and malicious hoax. It was in the days after the uh, uh, Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, some uh, person whose identity has never been learned uh, on the AOL service. This is at a time when AOL had 2.5 million members. It was huge at that time, tiny by today's standards. And uh, the hoax was uh, to suggest that somebody was selling uh, T-shirts uh, celebrating uh, uh, in, in a parody way the Oklahoma City bombing as if it was something funny. And they put, uh, and, and they put Ken Zaran's phone number at the bottom, uh, said, call me to buy these uh, uh, T-shirts with nasty slogans on them. Uh, uh, a Oklahoma City radio station got wind of this and uh, on a drive-by, a, a, a drive-time radio show exhorted the Oklahoma City community to uh, call up Ken Zarin and tell him uh, what you think about his uh, uh, mocking of the victims of the Oklahoma City bombing. Just a horrible fact pattern. Uh, and uh, Mr. Zarin contacted AOL, reached uh, someone in the uh, general counsel's office, uh, made other communications to AOL saying, please take this down. Ultimately, it was taken down. It, the, the poster was putting them up, but we're using different, slightly different screen names and the like. And so it was sort of a cat and mouse game. But ultimately, after a few days, the, the things came down. But Mr. Zaran sued AOL uh, uh, on a negligence theory, claiming that uh, AOL had negligently allowed uh, uh, this uh, defamatory or embarrassing material about him to be uh, up on its platform and didn't promptly enough take it down. Um, and uh, uh, 
AOL uh, represented b b uh, by me after the case got transferred to the Eastern District of Virginia uh, uh, asserted Section 230 immunity. Mr. Zaran's uh, main argument was that you don't, AOL, you don't get Section 230 immunity because uh, you were put on notice of this content by my phone calls and letters to you and you didn't get it down quickly enough. So once I put you on notice, uh, you no longer had the benefit of Section 230 because uh, Section 230 only uh, protects against, he would say, publisher liability, not distributor liability. So ultimately what happened was that the, the uh, Judge Ellis and then uh, uh, J uh, Judge Harvey Wilkinson, the Chief Judge of the Fourth Circuit, said no, that's not the correct interpretation of Section 230. It's, it's broader than that. Distributor liability is simply a subset or species of publisher liability. Uh, and um, therefore, AOL uh, has uh, complete immunity. And in fact, uh, Judge Wilkinson uh, issued a fairly sweeping decision, essentially saying that Section 230 provides online platforms, that wasn't the word then, but interactive computer services, with uh, uh, broad immunity from any uh, cause of action that would hold them responsible for failing to take down uh, 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 content or any other decisions made about whether or not content should be on their service. I, it's, it's, um, Judge Wilkinson was very careful to look at the objectives that, that Congress had uh, in enacting Section 230, and there are two key objectives uh, that he saw and that I think were correctly there. One is, is to promote robust free speech on internet platforms. And uh, the other is to uh, remove disincentives that would otherwise exist in the law, basically under First Amendment principles, for online platforms to engage in responsible self-regulation and moderation of the content on their panels, on their, on their platforms. And uh, it's, it's that second purpose to remove disincentives from responsible self-moderation uh, which often gets lost in discussions about Section 230. And why is it so that, that, uh, that this broad immunity actually creates space for platforms to self-regulate? If, if the absent Section 230, the First Amendment is going to be the main uh, defense in these cases. And the First Amendment is a very strong uh, defense that would probably cause platforms to win the vast majority of cases that are brought under Section 2, that, that where Section 230 wins. Because of Section 230, we haven't had a broad uh, development of First Amendment jurisprudence in this space because Section 230 is doing all that work. But if you took Section 230 away, either partially or totally, you would fall back to the First Amendment. And what the First Amendment says, based on the Smith v. California uh, proposition that um, uh, Professor Kosoff just mentioned, is is that you are free of liability, generally, absent knowledge, uh, absent being put on notice of, in a granular way of content that needs to be taken down. And if that is the standard, notice-based liability, strong notice-based liability, then platforms have a strong incentive to put their heads in the sand not set up mechanisms to receive reports of, of, of problematic, unlawful content on their platforms, not monitor, do self-monitoring, to just not act. And in fact, if you, if you, absent Section 230, two things would happen. Platforms would be discouraged from engaging in the tons of responsible self-moderation that they engage in, and they would also, uh, 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 sort of respond to a heckler's veto and take down content whenever they in fact got notice. We would have a much less successful, vibrant internet and we would not have uh, uh, companies that are able to uh, engage in these activities. Many of the uh, new entrants in this space just wouldn't be able to exist without this immunity. <coughs> Judge, uh, Judge Wilkinson was very perceptive I think he was very much in tune with uh, what Congress intended. And in fact, as we get into it later, I, I, I also think that, in fact, there are lots of strong reasons why Section 230 remains a very good, a very good uh, 
uh, uh, uh, policy choice by Congress, N maybe not so much for the big incumbents, but for the, 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 the future Facebooks of the world, the, the, uh, the, the new companies that, that haven't even been dreamt of, that aren't even going to be able to get off the ground if they, if they don't uh, have these kinds of protections. Let's hear some other perspectives on Zarin. So, Ben, I know you have argued that, and I, you know, let you speak for yourself, but I, I know you've argued that Zarin itself was correctly decided, but that some of its progeny go at least a step too far in abrogating common law doctrines. Is, is that right? And what do you mean by that? That is right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, I'm going to make a few comments that I prepared. Uh, normally, on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9.45, I'm teaching my first-year tort students, so this feels like an appropriate time. Pro forgive me if I'm a bit too professorial. Uh, I, um, my principal theme is one that I feel even more strongly about after hearing um, the excellent comments of Jeff and Pat, and that is that when we deal with this area of the law in our American system, we need to realize that first and foremost, we are normally dealing with state tort law. So we need to understand state tort law, not only the law of defamation, but tort law more generally, before we leap to the First Amendment and before we leap, leap to the statute. So I'm, trying to, I'm gonna try to give you the little old torts professor uh, version of Section 230. First and foremost, the common law of torts and not just negligence law tends to place a great deal of weight on the distinction between bringing about harm and failing to stop others from bringing about harm. That's to say there is some form of what we call the misfeasance, nonfeasance distinction doing work in virtually all torts. More generally, it's not simply one's causal contribution in a sense of but-for causation that matters. What matters is whether a defendant is doing something, to give an example, punching a person in the nose rather than failing to stop someone else from punching him in the nose or owning the tavern in which the punch occurs. In defamation law, be it libel or slander, publication is normally an act the New York Times printed up millions of copies of the paper that contained the allegedly defamatory words over which it was sued in Times versus Sullivan. A defendant who tells his friends that the plaintiff is a prostitute has spoken some words. Janet X is a prostitute, for example. That is slander, even if he first heard it from someone else and just repeated it. Failing to force this would-be slanderer to leave one's cocktail party before he says those words, it's not slander. The cocktail party host is not liable for getting, failing to get the person to leave. Similarly, failing to throw out copies of the defamatory New York Times is not liable, okay? So negligence law works a similar way, but it has many exceptions. A private girls' school can be held liable for failure to protect its students from being assaulted by somebody else in their dormitory. Similarly, a landlord who allows all the locks and security systems to go fallow or a mall owner who keeps a dark parking lot in a dangerous neighborhood. Now, it's far less clear whether the common law of libel has real exceptions in the way that negligence law does. And even if it does, it's even less clear what their parameters are and whether they would survive the New York Times versus Sullivan revolution in First Amendment law. Terminologically, the question for the torts of libel and slander and defamation more generally is uh, whether the claim will satisfy the publication element of the tort. Um, there are a few cases in which the act of selling what someone else has published can satisfy the publication element once there's notice. But it's not like this is a big part of the law. It's a teeny tiny part of the law where notice will actually help give the plaintiff a claim. There are also a few cases that suggest the owner of a wall on which someone else has placed a defamatory message 
has a duty to remove the message. In saying this, the court has meant that if you are the wall owner, and literally the case I'm talking about is a bathroom stall with graffiti, if you are the wall owner and you have noticed your failure to remove it will satisfy the publication element. On the other hand, no court has been willing to say that a wire carrier, like uh, AT&T, a telephone company, that is the medium through which a defamatory statement is made can be treated as satisfying the publication element. And there has never been any suggestion that notice would transform a wire carrier into one who qualifies as a publisher. Okay, now, that's the background that I see. It's not inconsistent with Jeff's, it's a little different in its emphases. Um, in the early 90s, legal scholars began writing articles and law review notes about how internet service providers would fit into this framework. It's worth bearing in mind that in the 1980s and the early 1990s, tort scholars and courts were increasingly skeptical about the normal relevance of an action, inaction, misfeasance, nonfeasance distinction, and many were increasingly interested in extending liability in torts to deep pockets regardless of where their conduct fit into the framework for doing or preventing. Unsurprisingly, some scholars during this era advocated for the expansion of these categories to ISPs. Judge Leisure and Cubby versus CompuServe declined to impose liability on CompuServe, as Jeff mentioned, but in dicta indicated that an ISP serving as a sort of library for a content provider might indeed satisfy the publication element if there were notice. Now what happened is this. The plaintiff's lawyers in Stratton Oakmont expressly drew upon the affirmative duty of negligence law in craft, I'm sorry. Um, in crafting their arguments that prodigy did satisfy the publication element. One of the exceptions in negligence law is that one who has undertaken to protect someone from the harm that an external source or a third party is going to cause that person um, does have a duty to protect. Okay? The, the misfeasance, nonfeasance distinction fails to protect the defendant who has made such an undertaking because Prodigy had undertaken to its consumers and to the public to engage in screening and filtering, it should be treated as satisfying the publication element, they said. It should be treated as a publisher. Justice Ain from uh, the New York Supreme Court, which is the lower court in New York, understandably accepted this argument and Prod Prodigy was on the hook. So the internet industry went ballistic when this occurred, <coughs> fledgling industry, and it sensibly went to Washington. The problem was no company would now volunteer to filter or screen because doing so was the surest way to be treated as a publisher. Um, the incentives for the industry were now exactly backwards, so Congress had to do something, as Jeff pointed out. Now, uh, here, here is my punchline, and I promise I'm nearly done. It turns out that state legislatures across the country had faced a nearly analogous policy problem with negligence law for decades. Negligence law's misfeasance, nonfeasance distinction left on its own tells highway motorists that they will face no liability to failure to offer roadside assistance to someone in a medical emergency situation if that person is a stranger to them. We say there is no duty to rescue strangers. Okay? However, if one undertakes to stop and help and then things go badly with the, the, the person in need of emergency service, the law says that there is a duty to rescue and there is liability for the ensuing injuries. So every state legislature in this country has said, that is a crazy set of incentives, okay? It means that doctors, nurses, and other potential volunteers 
who do stop to be good Samaritans will actually face liability, and that's a problem. So every state has passed a statute called a Good Samaritan statute, which says that undertaking to stop and rescue someone in such a situation does not cre create a duty to rescue and does not create liability. You can do so without fear that there will be liability. So the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, is actually literally called a Good Samaritan statute. That's what it's called. It's, um, it was enacted to reverse the pathological set of incentives in the Stratton Oakmont case. The language of C2 is as clear as the Good Samaritan label itself. Quote, no provider or user of an interactive service shall be held liable on account of action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to material that the provider or users consider to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, and so on, including a defamatory content. The Good Samaritan connection here is unmistakable. So one wonders why courts have not paid more attention to this, and they haven't. Um, part of the answer is that C2, what I just quoted from, is actually not mostly what's bothering people. It's not the problem. C1 is the problem, and it doesn't discuss voluntary undertake undertakings. So um, here, here's what happens. C1. The problem is there was no baseline. So C2 says we don't reverse the baseline just because you volunteered. But in fact, states didn't have any law about what should happen generally here. So there was no, there was no nice, clear, firm rule saying just because you own the, the virtual wall on which people are posting this stuff, it doesn't mean you have a duty to take it down. There, there was nothing like that in the law. That's what C1 is. C1 says um, that um, you shall not be treated as the publisher or speaker just because you're the ISP. That's its basic point. Um, and um, so what does all this imply for me? There are several different conclusions. First, Zarin is correctly decided. The court got it right. Second. Um, this isn't really an immunity. Immunity is a whole different concept. It's about somebody who performs because of their job or their station. You know, you can't go after them in litigation. That's not what this is. It's not it was what it was ever designed to be. Third of all, if a platform actually says, um, you know, we like this comment, we're going to repost it, we're going to blare it all over, or a user does that, this is a totally different thing. This is an affirmative act to project something, put it out there more. And there should, there's no protection in CDA 230 for that. In fact, in 2003, the Ninth Circuit says, ah, we don't like the active-passive distinction. There's no protection. There's full protection even if you go reposting things. That's part of why we have such a crazy internet now. It doesn't matter if, how much you try to spread it. So that was a mistake. And finally, this is basically mostly about defamation law. It's not clear at all how it should be applied to other areas of the common law. And um, the broad interpretations of CDA 230 have really stopped states from allowing their tort law to experiment. Thanks. So there's <clears throat> a ton more that could be said about Zarin, but why don't we move this? That's a nice segue to the sort of scope of Section 230. Um, and you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of publication torts. We haven't talked about um, what happens when a platform is publishing its own content, um, products liability claims. Carrie, can I turn to you on that? What's the scope of the immunized contact in your view? What have you argued? What, how have courts reacted? Obviously, this is a disputed area. What's the scope? Basically limitless. <laughs> um, I think that uh, Zarin has been interpreted so extravagantly that it's basically eaten up tort law when it comes to um, interactive computer services. And um, I think that plays out really, played out really well, um, not well, but horribly in um, a case that I brought against 
murder. My client um, was a 33-year-old man who had broken up with an abusive ex-boyfriend, and the ex-boyfriend then began impersonating him on Grindr and um, created profiles with my client's picture and saying that he had rape fantasies and that he was all lubed up and ready to go. And then the ex would communicate via direct message on Grindr and post my client's geolocating information and then send people to my client's home and to his job. People that thought my client wanted uh, to fulfill their rape fantasies. Uh, individuals would show up at all hours. They'd be waiting for him in the stairwell at home. They would be following him when he was walking his dog. They would follow him into the bathroom at work. And it was all because of, of Grindr. And my client reported it to the police 10 times. He got an order of protection against his ex-boyfriend, and nothing stopped. He flagged the accounts for Grindr 50 times, and Grindr did nothing. So Pat, you know, expertly argued um, that, that, that our interactive computer services would be incentivized to, to do good and to moderate their own content. And it's just not happening. It's, it's the absolute opposite. They see Section 230 and all the case law over the last two, couple decades and see it as a pass to take no action whatsoever. And, and they also have interpreted Zarin to basically, you know, um, give them the right to, to argue for Section 230 even when it's not a, a publication. Tort. So in, in Grindr, we, we sued Grindr uh, we, for injunctive relief and, and also um, for product liabilities because we, we argued that if they could not stop an abusive user from using their dating, dating app, which facilitates in-person meetings with their geolocating patented technology. And um, then, then they've developed a dangerous app because it's absolutely foreseeable that, that sometimes a dating app is going to be used by rapists, by child predators, and by stalkers. <coughs> but Grindr in court, their, their lawyers told us that they didn't have the technology to exclude a user. And that was shocking to us. And, um, but on a 12B6 motion, our case was dismissed. Um, Grindr didn't even have to plead that they were an interactive computer service. They didn't have to plead that they were being sued for, for publication or that they were being sued for information provided by an information content provider. The judge played computer scientist. Um, and, and it's one of my biggest beefs with, with the way that courts have interpreted Section 230 is that even when you have a really solid, detailed complaint, judges are throwing these cases out in motions to dismiss. So the adversarial system is completely askew because the plaintiffs don't even have the, the, um, the basic right to, to do discovery, to, to get expert testimony on these cases, to find out what exactly the interactive compu the computer service is doing to, to make themselves um, uh, to, to moderate content. So um, I, I, I'm very opinionated about the fact that Section 230 is broken. It's putting all of us at danger. And there needs to be um, a fix. And um, courts are, are continuing to interpret um, these cases really, really um, broadly. And, and um, plaintiffs have no access to justice when they're being attacked through interactive computer services. <coughs> nodding along, and I know you've brought some of these product liability claims. Would you mind just kind of walking us through on your theory how these product liability claims work, why, in your view, I assume they're outside of Section 230, and then maybe we'll give Pat a minute afterwards to kind of respond because he was invoked uh, a minute ago. I think it's important a little bit before, and, and obviously I'm, you know, I'm not a professor. Uh, I'm not the lawyer that argued uh, Zarin over 20 years ago, uh, but I am the lead counsel on the cases that are current, currently being litigated over Section 230 in multiple states. Um, but in, before I get to that point, I think it's important that we look at how we got there and put a little bit of color on the paper of our cases to put it in context. 
Um, back in 2017, I had no idea what the Communications Decency Act was. I was on Facebook, I had all my followers, I was actively Instagramming. I thought cloud computing was where you store your iPhone photos. Um, and it was in early 2017 when I was first approached about taking a look at a sex trafficking civil case. Didn't know anything about sex trafficking either. Um, and I actually very reluctantly, well, I said no for a very long time, don't have time, successful trial practice, didn't need to do anything new, um, but I kept being approached. It was not about a tech case. It was about the hospitality angle of a sex trafficking case. And so finally, I, you know, my, talked to my team and I said, we got to take a look at this. Well, what is sex trafficking? What is going on? What is the climate? What is, what is it in general? Uh, we started investigating in the summer of 17, um, taking a look at you know, talking to sex trafficking victims, talking to law enforcement, talking to the NGOs. Um, and one of the things that developed very early on in our investigation was the role that tech plays in sex trafficking. Um, talking to the clients, no matter what state, no matter what city, the story was all the same. Met my trafficker on social media, was sold on a website, sometimes even sold on social media sites. It didn't matter who you put in front of me, the story was the same, whether it was from the parents who said they tried to reach out or tried to monitor the site um, and couldn't protect their child from it, or reached out to the big, some of my defendants in my suit, such as Facebook and Instagram, with zero response. They showed their emails, they showed their texts, and this pattern started to develop to my team in 17 that wait a minute, what's, what's going on? Uh, we were watching law enforcement fight this fight. We were watching the Department of Justice chase back page um, with little to no attack from civil justice. Um, and it was finally that we decided uh, in the winter of, or I guess um, the fall of 17, that we were going to take this battle. This was long before FOSTA-SESTA uh, was even on anybody's radar. Uh, we knew that we were going to start developing this case. Um, so we started to look at the case law. And I couldn't believe what I read. I mean, I understood and, and definitely read. In fact, I still have the transcripts of Pat's argument uh, in my office, if you ever want to borrow it. Um, and it was brilliant, and it was extraordinary. But then you start to look at how the courts took this broad interpretation, um, as Carrie said, this extravagant interpretation about expanding it to really broad-based immunity and how you're taking this Good Samaritan concept um, that was just discussed, and well, what happens when that Good Samaritan then turns around and profits from the sale of children? What happens when that Good Samaritan then facilitates knowingly the sex trafficking of children? What happens when a tech company, the biggest and brightest tech companies, go in-house to the notorious online sex traffickers and help them build their business, process their credit cards, reach overseas, what is the law going to do? Um, for my team, it was, we have to do something about it. Um, and so we assembled a team and, and decided we were gonna start drafting the case. Uh, we filed our first sex trafficking case in uh, October of 2018 against Facebook. Shortly after, in response to fake, Facebook's statement in response to our lawsuit, we sued Instagram. Uh, both of those cases are still pending. Um, by happenstance in the same court in Harris County, Texas, the 334th. Uh, we then filed another case against Facebook, uh, which is pending in the 157th District Court, all state courts. Um, we took this fight uh, initially in state court. We are still fighting it out. Um, I will let you all know what the arguments from the defense are. And I thought for sure I was gonna draw Pat. I kept telling him backstage. I still am waiting to see his appearance on one of my cases. Mm -hmm. um, the fight is still Zarin. Believe it or not, you can look at Facebook's uh, appeal, and it is um, f probably 80% Zarin, uh, maybe 5% FOSTA-SESTA. They don't want to talk about FOSTA-SESTA. And it was a fight that we knew we were going to have. We were willing to have the fight on Zarin before FOSTA-SESTA came out. And we don't rest our laurels one bit on FOSTA-SESTA, uh, but we do want to take the fight on Zarin because of this broad interpretation of how you took a Good Samaritan law and have started to pull it away from defamation. Um, one of the promising things that we saw was, well, I'll tell you, the law was not favorable to us when we filed. But starting in 2010, we started looking at some language that was coming out of the courts in Chicago. Uh, we started looking at our Houston sister cities, some cases in Beaumont, Texas, of all places. Uh, we started looking at 
Carey's case and some of the language that we were seeing in those courts, while they still were decided against our position, there was some language in there that started to really question publisher and how are we talking about Communications Decency Act, which specifically addresses publisher and have now gotten to where a Good Samaritan is knowing, knowingly facilitating or refusing to take down somebody that they know is, is being harassed at their workplace. Um, and so there was some promises there, you know. So you say, I have a chance. And on that, we built our first case. Um, the current status is uh, we are parked in the 14th Court of Appeals in Texas on our Facebook and Instagram cases. Um, we anticipate a win. The Texas Supreme Court um, has ruled in our favor on motions to stay. Uh, Facebook and Instagram, um, very formidable defense counsel, um, really enjoy working against them, has made arguments that the CDA immunity grants them stays in all litigation until the underlying uh, CDA immunity issue is decided. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court did not agree and has let us proceed uh, in our case down at the district court level while we are waiting on the 14th Court of Appeals. Um, we are the first team to defeat the Communications Decency Act argument on motions to dismiss. Most of these cases, as Ms. Goldberg pointed out, are tossed out on, on pleadings alone. Um, and so we were um, pleased. I can tell you that if you read the transcript, with, please don't, it's eight hours. I can give you a summary highlighted. Um, it is, uh, the courts were embracing our argument on Zarin. Um, it is not so much reflected in the brief opinions that were issued by the state court, um, but if you read the transcript, the Zarin agreement with our argument is there. Um, some of you may be wondering what happened uh, with our Salesforce case in California. We currently have cases on file against Salesforce in Texas that have been ordered to be consolidated. We are pending a judge on that consolidation. Um, and we did drop a hearing in California, but I would ex you know, give you a little color on that. Um, my team was not present for that argument. Uh, so we are currently in the process of appealing it. Um, I can. Well I, well, I will say, if my team's in the room, I don't think we're going to lose. But give us the opportunity to be in the room is what I would say to my opposing counsel. Um, and so we anticipate on getting that one back in California. Um, you know, the big fight we're really, really having right now is Facebook. Um, first and Instagram come out and they say, well, uh, Texas doesn't have jurisdiction over Facebook. They fought us on that for a while. We defeated uh, the special appearance. Of course, they've appealed that as well. Um, and that is also pending in front of the 14th Court of Appeals. Um, they then said, well, uh, Jane Doe, 12 year old, 12 year old, 14 year old, uh, consented and has agreed to have all of her cases heard in Santa Clara, California. Um, obviously we disagree with that based on their age and exactly how it was disclosed, this forum selection clause to these children. Um, that was a fight, we defeated that, then we defeated the CDA. Um, but we are still fighting because fa uh, Facebook and Instagram have taken the position that the Communications Decency Act and FOSTA-SESTA preempts state court causes of action. Um, from a practical sense, um, I find it hard to believe that we have so many state legislatures that have taken the lead on a public health crisis um, that exists in their states that somehow the states don't have a right to regulate or address this public health crisis. Um, but that is a fight that we are having, and again, I think we're going to win, um, so stay tuned on that. Um, there's two things, and I, I'm sure Pat is chomping at the bit to come at me, so I'm going to give him that chance. Uh, I, told him, <laughs> I told him to be sweet to me. I said, be sweet. Um, I, you know, there's, there's two things I think that we need to say about, and I've kind of addressed it on the CDA, is this distortion and this pull away from publisher. That's defamation language. If Congress wanted to say that there is immunity that exists in this, it would have said no publisher should be, you know, or, or no in interactive computer service should be held responsible for any tort under any circumstance. It didn't say that. It said specifically publisher, and that language comes straight from l defamation law, not from um, not from the systems and and these so-called good Samaritans that have created this public health crisis. Um, the only last thing I would like to share with y'all before I turn it over is uh, I think our mail, one, one case that we have pending uh, that you might want to take a look at, it's going to be the uh, Jane Doe versus MailChimp that is pending in Atlanta Federal Court with Justice Billy Ray. 
It is going to be the very first time a federal court addresses our arguments against a tech company. Um, MailChimp to me, um, all of the cases are fascinating, but MailChimp to me is the most fascinating case because as we were handling these cases on behalf of our clients, we were so excited to see the de uh, Department of Justice move in and, and seize Backpage. But what we immediately saw after that was another tech company in this country step into the shoes and assist Backpage's Amsterdam clone and then reaching these victims again to re-victimize and to generate a Backpage clone that existed in Amsterdam. Uh, the Department of Justice has their hands full in fighting sex trafficking. Um, they do not need the, to have to also fight America's best and brightest tech talent. Uh, it's hard enough fighting sex trafficking. Uh, my team, speaking on behalf of my clients and my team, are excited to stand next to law enforcement and provide civil justice support in this fight. What do you got, Mr. Carone? <laughs> Thanks so much, Annie. There's so many things to say and so little time. <laughs> uh, I'll just pick off a few. I'm not sure they're going to be in the right order. F first of all, the complaint that Section 230 has expanded beyond the defamation space. First, obviously Congress intended it to be broad, uh, uh, having a broad scope amongst much more than just uh, garden variety defamation cases. Otherwise, why would this, this, the statute have all of the exceptions that it does with respect to federal criminal law, with respect to copyright law, with respect to privacy law? Uh, um, if, 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 it, if this was just a narrow, uh, 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 if Congress was just narrowly getting at defamation law, it certainly wouldn't have uh, had needed to even think about those exceptions, which obviously have nothing to do with defamation law. And in fact, it needs to be, uh, this has to be done with it in a, in a broad stroke. If, 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 um, if there's going to be a heckler's veto uh, uh, causing uh, content to be taken down all the time, plus a, uh, a deterrent to responsible self-regulation because the, uh, the, without Section 230, the entire incentive for all platforms, even the ones that want to be very responsible, is to stick their head in the sands and not become aware of any of the content flowing through their systems. Section 230 has removed that, and it needs to remove that on a broad-based uh, uh, level in order for it to, to have its positive impacts. The um, a big problem here that isn't doesn't affect any other area of, of 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 commerce or the media is the extraordinary volume of content that these platforms are handling, um, and uh, Justice Judge Kaczynski in the roommates case talked about Section 230. <laughs> saving uh, platforms from uh, 10,000 duck bites of litigation. Almost all of the litigation that has been brought against uh, platforms uh, and, and in which the platforms have succeeded based on Section 230 probably would fail in any event under, under normal law. Uh, all the Terrorism Act cases that I've been defending Twitter in, for example. Most of those cases, while, while Section 230 has been a defense in some of those cases, in most of those cases, uh, Twitter and Facebook and Google are winning those cases based on uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the elements of the Anti-Terrorism Act. They're not winning it for the most part on Section 230. There's a total lack of causation. Uh, the Attorney General statement that Section 230 is cutting into uh, the ability of victims of terrorism to, um, uh, to uh, get compensation from platforms is, is just flat out wrong. Those cases are, for the most part, being decided not on Section 230 grounds, but based th 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 those terrorist victims, yes, they, had a, they're, they're, they, they have tragic stories, terrible things have happened to them, but the platforms are not responsible, aside from Section 230. So there's a lot of mis misinformation out there. The, also, I, it's, it, you know, I'm only here speaking on behalf of myself, not on behalf of any of my clients, but the amount of effort I see uh, my clients go through to uh, deal with problematic content on uh, uh, their platforms is extraordinary. Uh, Google has more than 10,000 employees uh, devoted to uh, 
to, to this. Facebook has uh, an even larger number, you know, moderating content in 60 different, 50 or 60 different languages. It's always going to be imperfect. There's no way with, with, with billions of users and, and, and uh, content being uploaded uh, uh, at a, you know, much more than a fire hose to get it all. What we need are, 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 are incentives and, and policies that promote, um, uh, the, you know, leave space for respons responsible self-moderation, don't cause platforms to stick their head in the sand, and, and that also um, allow them not to be taken down, particularly the smaller upstarts, not to be taken down by 10,000 duck bites of litigation. Section 230 fortunately does make it easy for the, 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 these uh, uh, platforms uh, and the defendants to win these cases without enormous e expense. Um, it, you know, they could litigate them under uh, traditional principles. They'd be much more expensive. They will most of the time get to the same result. Um, so I think um, uh, it, Section 230, again, you know, it, this is a hard issue. There are, there are costs to it, yes. But uh, I think that um, to uh, remap this uh, space that, 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 the, that has been working for the past quarter century uh, very well, despite the fact that there are bad things happening, there are bad things happening throughout society, um, it should not be changed, and, and much more attention. Section 230 puts the focus on the actual wrongdoers. The, in, in Kerry's case, that 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 uh, that ex-boyfriend who was being incredibly malicious. I don't know why the legal system uh, didn't put that person in jail if he was doing the crimes that you're suggesting that he was doing. I don't know why it didn't work. That is the way uh, 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 things should be solved. Um, ben and Jeff, are you interested in weighing in? Do we think that those common law cause of actions are completely abrogated, both in terms of how courts are treating it and in terms of Section 230, kind of rightly understood? Uh, sure. So I'll just say, based on my research, having spoken with the members who were involved with drafting Section 230, as well as uh, staffers and uh, the industry folks and civil liberties folks at the time, uh, they knew that this was going to be a, have very broad protections. And I did not see any evidence that this was just limited to defamation. In fact, the second case ever argued under uh, Section 230 is also a case that Pat had argued uh, involving a really tragic case of a mother suing AOL because there was um, a video uh, child pornography of her son, 11-year-old son, that was being marketed on AOL, and AOL allegedly had notice and didn't do anything. Um, so I, I don't really see the record, in the record that I reviewed for the book, of there being just a specific limit uh, to defamation. I would just also add, um, in some of these discussions, we have been talking about the platforms, and I think the platforms and the Section 230 debate is usually shorthand for Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and there are a lot of other platforms that I, th some of which are, are smaller and actually do have much more thoughtful moderation processes than the larger ones, and I think we have to think about the impact of whatever change. I think there will be changes to Section 230. That's my guess. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I think whatever changes there are, I, I, my, I've been in D.C. for so long that I think probably the big companies will have be able to influence the changes so they better, so they're, it's easier for the big companies to meet than the smaller ones. I think we need to really look at all of the platforms and figure out if there are changes um, what what is the goal, and how how do we make it so it doesn't actually increase sort of the anti-competitive concerns that we've been hearing about? Um, thanks. Uh, I think that uh, even though the occurrence of the words "publish speaker" and by the way, "or speaker" su suggests a basic concern with libel or slander. Um, but I, I do think that um, those give it the flavor of something that's about defamation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think I agree with Jeff that it's just um, not a realistic way to understand the whole thing, that it ever is going to be purely limited 
therefore was aimed purely for, for defamation. The, uh, what I want to suggest is a, a point of compromise between <coughs> Pat on the one hand and Annie and Carrie on the other. I don't think any of them would agree with this, but um, um, you know, um, generally speaking, our tort law does not want to impose huge liabilities on those who could, because of their situation, do a lot more to protect, but don't. And even where they're big companies, we don't always do that. On the other hand, our legal system, when it sees cases like the um, one that Kerry uh, litigated, is not willing to just throw up its hands and say, no accountability altogether. Something so extreme as that. The outliers, where they over and over and over again, they're asked to do something to protect this person. And by the way, to protect this person, not just against potential reputational harm, but against physical injury. Um, that, that, the willingness of courts to go all the way out and to abandon all nuance, I don't see why that has to stick. I don't see why we have to choose between a form of protection that gets rid of all possible liability, no matter how much knowledge, how unique the situation is of the defendant who could have prevented this. Uh, on the one hand, or on the other hand, basically making 10,000 people not nearly enough, really 100,000 people doing all screening. I don't think it's right that it has to choose between those two extremes. So we, ha we have 10 minutes remaining, so why don't we do a sort of lightning round of parting remarks, and everyone can have two minutes, and we'll, we'll sort of start down um, at the end with Annie. And I'll just give a couple of suggestions of things we did not, we were sort of planning on <coughs> discussing and did not get to in case people want to address it. One is, um, what are the kind of changes we see with changing technology? We're no longer in a world where we have AOL messaging message boards. Um, platforms curate content, they promote content. How does that change, um, just in a very practical way, you know, how we talk about, for example, um, very statutory terms like interactive computer services, like publishing, um, how does it change what you're seeing on the ground in terms of where the sort of frontiers are in litigation? Um, and does that accord with the way Section 230 was, was meant to be applied? Is, does Section 230 need to be amended in order to apply to these new technologies, or is the existing framework we have enough and courts are responding correctly? Uh, so, so those are some ideas you could talk about, but also, you know, the, the floor is yours for two minutes. <laughs> on something that's really important is how has technology changed? And I think stating these broad brush statements about it's impossible for tech companies to be able to monitor their platforms, um, the million pecks of litigation, um, these broad brush statements that are being made about um, you know, whether tech can sustain the monitoring imposition or whether they can sustain the litigation, uh, there's no data that supports any of these contentions. Um, you know, or at least data that's not paid for by big tech, uh, both in the <laughs> academics and in the studies. And so I just, I, you know, I, I think we have to look at the way that the system was created 20 years ago. It is not serving the public. And the law isn't just about books and theories, and it's about how does it affect everyday lives, and how does it affect, and who should be responsible for these uh, public health crises and harms and losses that have been created. Uh, in my cases, criminal law has played its role. Criminal justice has put these traffickers and sometimes these Johns uh, in, in criminal. But what about what the law allows for the companies and the entities that knowingly benefited from the facilitation? And uh, you know, I just would encourage um, that we continue um, to see what the courts do with the new laws and the development. Uh, I actually take a rather conservative position on any further um, revision of the CDA, I do think it serves an important pur uh, purpose. I do think we need to stay leaders globally, but we must do so not at the expense of our society and our children. Um, and so I just would say any changes, stay tuned, give me another year, and we'll see where we get on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use my two minutes to address something that Pat said, which um, I think a lot of uh, people have said to me, which is, you know, it's really too bad that, you know, um, your client couldn't be helped 
by the criminal justice system. But the criminal, I mean, our government has a monopoly on the criminal justice system. It's tort law, it's, tor it's centuries of tort law that empowers the individual to get justice when they're being harmed. That's the great equalizer for the cost of a couple hundred dollars. Any single one of us can go to court and hold somebody accountable for the harm that they've caused us. And when a platform is facilitating over 1,200 men to come in person to sexually assault you and does nothing and, and basically hides behind Section 230 as the standard of care that, that allows them to do nothing, then that's, that's a, an access to justice issue. And this isn't about speech because a lot of these lawsuits have to do with conduct, not content. Let Section 230 exist and regulate content and, and you know, people should be able to call one another the B word on Twitter, it, you know, without being sued or, and stuff. But, but, you know, it's just, it's gone too far. And I really feel that um, Section 230 needs to be changed in, in a few fundamental ways. We need injunctive relief for situations where there's an emergency that needs to be addressed. It needs to be limited to publication torts like obscenity and defamation. It needs to be an affirmative defense so that it actually has to be pled and our judges aren't the ones put in the position of, of having to make these factual determinations. It needs to be, uh, uh, pl plaintiffs need to be able to sue when companies violate their own terms of service. Like terms of services are basically illusory. <laughs> things because because of section 230 if a company breaches its own terms of service like grinders did grinders said that it could exclude a user but then secretly didn't set secretly um, didn't have the technology to actually do that um, but yet my client didn't have the right to sue them for for breaching their own terms of service um, and I mean that's that's basically all, all, all I got you know the this whole idea that there's this great big exception for, for um, federal crime. Kind of a misnomer because I think it's been used once in the entire history um, of the CDA. These companies don't actually get criminally prosecuted. Um, and so this isn't like some great exception that, that should be celebrated. Uh, I guess it's my turn. So I, we're, we're past the, the hour that we were allotted here, but so, I guess I'll just make two very quick points. Um, one, Section 230 is not just for big tech. There are thousands and thousands of uh, other websites out there uh, that are doing wonderful things for society, and they couldn't exist uh, if they were going to be subject to 10,000 bytes of litigation. And if you want to lock in the incumbents, then, then strip Section 230 away you know, the, the, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, perhaps they will be able to do just fine under that uh, scheme. The uh, upstarts won't be able to get off the ground. And so you have to you be very careful as if you're gonna, what you're gonna do to this, this balance. Second point, you know, uh, what's allowed on uh, a street corner uh, uh, or, you know, uh, in Hyde Park or the like, uh, is, is, is everything that the First Amendment allows. And there's a lot of awful content that you wouldn't like to have on your, on your screen every day that someone can go and speak on the street corner. And so you've got a number of very responsible platforms doing it for themselves, for their users, for their advertisers that don't want to be associated with all kinds of dreck, are engaging in a lot of responsible self-moderation to try to make their platforms civil, safe places. And they have to have the freedom to be able to do that to make their services work. And Section 230 is, that is one of the many benefits that Section 230 is, apply, is, is providing. And we just got to keep in that there's a lot going on here and things could be badly messed up uh, if, if there's just some knee-jerk reaction to, to, to radically change the, the way that things have been. I agree that we should not ha have a knee-jerk reaction to change things radically. And uh, I also agree uh, in a First Amendment context, we need to uh, act carefully. We do protect speech and we ought to protect speech. I also think the background 
of the early 90s of perceiving maybe we're going too crazy about liability for big companies. We need to keep all of those that in things in mind. But we should not abandon the possibility of finding a middle path, crafting a middle path that is better than the one we have now. And I, I applaud the department for um, putting together this se session to try to work on that process. Um, so Section 230 was really passed under a theory of user empowerment, meaning that uh, the company, the platforms will adopt certain moderation practices and there will be a market-based decision, you know, if they're moderating too much or too little, uh, that's what the users, the users will help dictate that through the marketplace. Um, what we have to look at is, is that working first off and in 2020 rather than 1996? And then second, if it's not, what is the alternative? And I've, there's obviously a lot of complaints about Section 230 from all sides. Too much moderation, too little moderation. I frankly don't know how we get a consensus on even that issue. But if we do, then we have to look at what, how do we instill a better moderation system than what we have under Section 230? I don't know the answer to that, but I do think, I hope that people start looking at the question of what next. And I hope that that will, that as we're thinking about what changes to make, we look at, okay, on day one in a changed environment, what will the internet look like? Please join me in thanking our panelists. our first panel for a fascinating discussion. It was a great way to kick off the afternoon. So I just want to say we're going to have our second panel start shortly. I know there was um, some concern about the sound issues. So what we're going to do is to take about a five minute break. We think we have a fix to help our folks in the back to hear better before we start our second panel on addressing illicit activity online. Um, so please bear with us and thanks again to our first panel for getting us started.
gathering people from outside. Can everyone hear now? Good? Great. Online, Assistant Attorney General Beth Williams. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you for being here. Um, as Brady said, my name is Beth Williams. I'm the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice. Um, we heard in the first panel about the evolution of Section 230. Um, promulgated and some of the litigation that surrounds it. In this panel, we're going to address um, some of the harms that we're seeing and the, the harms that have occurred online, and then how internet and interactive service, uh, com computer services are addressing those harms, and whether the current version of Section 230 really incentivizes them to do so. I'm very fortunate to share the stage this morning with people who have extensive experience in this area and expertise in matters involving Section 230. Um, first, I'll start with, uh, to my left, Professor Marianne Franks from the University of Miami School of Law. Um, at the other end of the panel is, uh, is Ms. Yoda Soros. She is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMIC. Uh, we also have uh, Doug Patterson on the panel. He is the Attorney General of Nebraska and has advocated for Section 230 reforms. Then we have Professor Kate Klonick from St. John's University School of Law, who is, among other things, a platform governance expert. And finally, we have Matt Shears, the president of the Computer and Communications Industry Association, or CCIA, which represents a number of technology companies, both big and small. We could start today by looking at the types of harms that we're seeing on the internet. What are we really concerned about, and what are we currently doing about these harms? Um, my first question is for Ms. Soros. From your perspective at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, can you tell us about the online harms your organization is seeing and the efforts that are going on in this area? Sure. Thank you, Beth. I'll try to speak close uh, to the microphone. Um, you know, primarily, uh, NICMIC is a, pri is a private nonprofit organization, and as our name suggests, our two main programs of work are um, to serve as the national clearinghouse for missing and exploited children issues. Obviously, the topic of today's um, workshop lends itself more to our programs of work related to reducing child sexual exploitation. Um, one of our main programs that we run to try to reduce child sexual exploitation is the cyber tip line. The cyber tip line is um, really a quite simple reporting mechanism in, in many ways. It provides an opportunity for members of the public as well as electronic service providers to report suspected child sexual exploitation to NCMEC. Um, we have a process to analyze those reports and then make them available to law enforcement across the country and around the world. Can you um, talk a little bit about NICMIC and specifically um, what types of abuse tips NICMIC receives on its tip line? Yes. 
Our tip line, we receive uh, reports that um, include a, a range of child sexual exploitation, child, child sex trafficking, enticement, extrafamilial molestation, but by far the largest category of reports that we are receiving relate to what is termed under the law child pornography. Um, many are, are beginning to uh, use the more appropriate term child sexual abuse material um, to, uh, to find those images. Mm -hmm. And can you describe, do you have a sense of what the scale of this problem is? We know that CSAM or child sexual abuse imagery is um, available online, is prevalent. In your experience, what's the scope? Um, is it growing? And do you have data on how many children are being abused and their images shared online? NICMIC has seen tremendous growth over the past few years in the reports that we received to the cyber tip line. Um, just as an example, last year for 2019, we received just under 17 million cyber tip line reports. And I think one of the, the key numbers um, to pull out from there is those almost 17 million reports contained over 69 million files, um, including videos, images, and other pieces of content relating to the apparent child sexual exploitation. So the volume is tremendous, and it continues to grow, especially in areas like video content. Mm -hmm. And, and what, are the, what are the ages of the children, victims that you're seeing? Is it mostly older teenagers? Um, absolutely not, and I think that's often a, a misconception is that, um, you know, what is being reported, what, what the term child pornography connotes is um, an older teenager um, who might be made to look young, um, you know, something that is suggestive, uh, you know, of sexual activity. Uh, we see many um, pieces of content where children who are pre-verbal, who are too young to articulate the harm that is being caused to them, um, are being raped sexually abused, sexually tortured in images, and again, in live video with live audio, um, along with that video, all the way through to prepubescent, um, as well as younger teenagers. Professor Franks, um, in addition to being a professor of law, you're also the president and the legislative uh, and tech policy director of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. Um, can you explain what that is? And then also, from your experience, what are some of the more serious forms of harmful online content that you're seeing? Yes, thank you. The Cyber Civil Rights Initiative um, is essentially an organization that is aimed at protecting the civil rights and civil liberties of all people online, but with a special attention to populations and marginalized communities. We have a particular focus on issues such as privacy and free speech. And we really focus on exploitation and harm that happens to women and to sexual minorities and to racial minorities. Our essential goal is to take the idea of, of civil rights and to consider very carefully how those civil rights have either been protected or have been eroded by technology. And one of our particular areas of focus is non-consensual pornography, or sometimes referred to as revenge porn. And we have been active in the space of trying to address problems like non-consensual pornography in three ways, uh, through legislation where it's needed, that is to say when there are gaps in the law, and also in terms of working with technology companies to develop policies that could be more responsive to these kinds of violations, and also working on the policy front, um, just generalized policy front, of raising social awareness about some of these issues and highlighting the fact that for all the good that technology can often do, we have to be very, very attentive to the role that technology, social media, the internet plays in amplifying abuse, amplifying civil rights violations, and to talk about who should actually be taking responsibility for those kinds of conduct. Not just a situation where you have bad actors and nothing else. You have bad actors, you have bystanders, you have accomplices, you have people who are making profit um, off of these very bad actions and hiding under a shield that tells them they don't have any responsibility to intervene. Now, I know you drafted one of the very first um, model criminal statutes for non consensual uh, pornography or revenge porn. Um, has that been widely adopted by the states and has this helped to solve the problem? <clears throat> So one of the issues that we've faced in writing model statutes to try to address the problem of non-consensual pornography has been the pushback that we've received, often from the tech industry, but also from civil liberties groups, who attempt to argue that non-consensual pornography is a form of free speech. 
And so what we've seen in the last few years is that many states fortunately have taken this issue seriously, and I do want to take this moment to say that the reason that they're taking it seriously, really the credit for that should go to the victims who've come forward and have said that this is something that has happened to them, have been brave enough to talk about those experiences and to call for action so that it doesn't happen to anyone else. So what we've seen is a very rapid development in the last few years over states actually trying to take this issue seriously. My model statute has been used as a template in many of those states. We are now up to 46 states in Washington, D.C. that have restrictions on non-consensual pornography. But the answer to whether or not that is solving the problem is no, uh, for a couple of different reasons. One of the reasons is that in the majority of those 46 states, the law actually is extremely narrow and almost um, so narrow as to be toothless. That is, many states wrongly define the crime as one that requires a personal intent of malice, a personal desire to harm the victim. And it's precisely the nature of internet abuse that has made it possible for people to hurt each other even if that's not their express goal. Your average revenge porn site owner, and there are many revenge porn sites, uh, is someone who is not personally motivated to reach out and hurt any particular victim. It's a little bit in some ways almost worse than that. This is a person who doesn't care about how much harm this inflicts upon victims because this is a person who is going to be motivated by profit or by entertainment or by voyeurism. And so in the states where there are laws that say one of the elements of this offense is not just the unauthorized distribution of your private material, but that the perpetrator also has to have a personal reason for doing so, intending to harm that individual, then we're leaving out as much as 79% of all cases of non-consensual pornography, and we're not going after the sites that are really boosting this kind of content out. And so those states have done a very poor job of addressing this fully, and so we only have a handful of states that are doing it correctly. The other big problem is Section 230, which is to say, um, as I think was briefly mentioned this morning, uh, state criminal laws um, are trumped by Section 230. So a state can pass a law against non-consensual pornography, and it won't be the kind of law that you could use against an intermediary because of Section 230. The only way that you would be able to move around that kind of immunity is if there is a federal law that is passed against non-consensual pornography, because as was mentioned this morning, Section 230 defenses do not apply to violations of federal criminal law. We have introduced, there has been introduced a bill um, to do exactly this that we worked on with the Office of Congresswoman Jackie Speer and others, a bipartisan bill that was most recently reintroduced last summer. It's called the SHIELD Act, but it hasn't been voted on yet, and so as of yet, we do not have a federal response, which means that any intermediary, any revenge porn site right now is benefiting from the fact that Section 230 allows them to essentially engage in those operations and be shielded from liability harms that you hear sometimes from victims is that it's not just the uh, the taking of the video, but it's the um, continuous reposting, right? The, the fear that uh, people are always watching uh, and that that will continue to victimize it. I know that in some cases, um, offenders actually re continue to reach out to some victims um, throughout their lives. Um, can you talk at all to that? Or Ms. Soros, can you talk to that too? So this is one of the most severe aspects of being attacked online, especially in such an intimate way, when there is a document, um, a video, or a photograph that actually is the, itself the um, act of abuse. It can be repeated infinitely. And many victims will say that this is actually the worst part of it, because a lot of the, the material that we're talking about here is not necessarily even consensually obtained in the beginning it's sexual assaults, it's rapes, it's other forms of coerced content. So even the act itself might not have been consensual. Even if the act is consensual, very often the recording was not consensual. And even sometimes when the recording is consensual, the distribution is not consensual. So on any of these levels, if any part of the sexual consent has been violated, this has a massive impact on the victim, not just one time, but every single time someone views that image, that image gets downloaded, if you've ever asked, or if you want to ask what it's like um, to be a victim of this kind of abuse, ask them what happens when they type their name into a search engine, and everything that comes back is links to pornographic sites, and that their entire life is basically reduced to a sexually graphic image. So what we're hearing from victims is that it is about the amplification and the distribution, not just the um, actual beginning or original act of putting this out into the world. 
and this is really to contextualize this with the conversation from this morning, really does highlight the absurdity of insisting that Section 230 in any way is in fact fulfilling its goals in terms of being a Good Samaritan law because this is the opposite, right, of Good Samaritans. We know from the parable of the Good Samaritan that it's not the people who pass by the person who's been attacked and left in the ditch um, who are supposed to be the model of behavior. And it's certainly not supposed to be the people who attacked the person and left them in the ditch who's supposed to be a model for behavior. And yet that's exactly what Section 230 has done in not distinguishing between the people who are trying to actively help somebody who is in distress and who is vulnerable and all the people who are not only standing by and doing nothing, but may actually be going through that person's pockets and taking the money out. So until we actually address the fact that technology and intermediaries play that kind of role in soliciting, encouraging, amplifying, profiting from these kinds of violations, and it's not just, um, I should say, non-consensual pornography, but also um, domestic terrorism, also uh, deeply, deeply vicious misogyny, also uh, vicious campaigns of misinformation and disinformation that are causing a crisis not only in terms of people's personal lives, but public health and in foreign policy and in democracy itself, all of these issues come back to this question of the erosion of shared responsibility for terrible actions. And that is the role that Section 230 is playing in all of the major problems, I think we could, it's fair to say, um, that affect civil rights and civil liberties today. Well, proponents of um, FOSTA and SESTA, which is um, the law that we heard about on the last panel, uh, have tried to address this. Um, through uh, allowing state actions for child sex sexual abuse imagery. What does SESTA-FOSTA address, and how has it impacted the problems that you're seeing, Professor Franks? This might be a better question for Yoda, mm -hmm. but because we actually don't see much in terms of the impact of, mm -hmm. of FOSTA-SESTA because most of the issues that we're looking at are going to deal with <laughs> adult victims, and we'll be talking about essentially where an image is either unlawfully obtained or was lawfully obtained and then distributed without consent. It's not a trafficking issue so much as it is a violation of privacy issue in a very intimate sense. Um, but I will say that the perspective that we have on approaches like SESTA-FOSTA, that is piecemeal approaches, to try to tinker with Section 230 to say there's this one particularly bad form of activity that we should address specifically, we do not think that that's actually the best way to reform Section 230, that looking for exceptions and trying to make carve-outs is actually making the statute extremely unwieldy. And it also, I think, unintentionally sets up a hierarchy of harms that suggests that somehow sex trafficking uniquely is something that shouldn't get Section 230 immunity, when of course there are multiple forms of harm that probably also qualify for that. Source, do you agree? How has SESTA-FOSTA um, affected your work? So I think we do have a different viewpoint, given that we are focused on child victims of sex trafficking. And what we've seen, it's, it's been less than two years, um, coming up on two years since the law was enacted. And as some of you will recall, it, it, it was one week um, in 2018 when Backpage was seized and taken down and SESTA was enacted. So there's a little bit of overlap and confluence, I think, of the influences there. But what we've seen um, really the week that SESTA was enacted and all the way through today is an immense disruption in the online marketplace for child sex trafficking. Um, again, that may be separate from the, the non-consensual um, issues that, that Marianne is, is dealing with. But we've seen that disruption continue. And I think the most striking thing we've seen is while the federal authorities did move to to um, seize and take down Backpage before the law was enacted, no single company has risen up um, since that time to fill the incredibly lucrative gap that Backpage left. And I think that is a testament to the deterrence impact of SESTA. Um, we would love to see more prosecutors uh, at the state and federal level utilizing um, the aspects of FOSTA and SESTA, but I think we can't underestimate the pure deterrence impact that the law um, has had and that we see in our particular mission. Well, speaking of state prosecutions, Attorney General Peterson, you've been the Attorney General of Nebraska since 2015. Um, in that time, what kinds of problems have you seen in your state with online crime? Well, <clears throat> when I came in in 2015, I would say online crimes, the primary awareness that I had was uh, in the area of human trafficking. At the time, uh, the federal uh, prosecutors were very active in Nebraska in the area of human trafficking, but we really didn't have a state law uh, that was strong enough. So we, we've developed that in the last four or five years. 
but it was primarily for online crimes. A big focus was on um, human trafficking and what abilities did we have, oftentimes deferring to the feds on the larger cases or questions with regards to online providers and what role they played. Um, it's now in five years, I think anyone within the industry sees how things are advancing so quickly. Um, it's not just us addressing questions with regards to human trafficking and how that was addressed in 2018 with the, the change in the law, but we see it in so many different areas. We have passed a, a law in uh, sex, uh, the, the um, legislation that was mentioned by Mary Ann. Uh, we haven't had any enforcements of it yet, and I think it does have some challenges. But we're seeing it in um, also in drug sales. Uh, we're seeing it in consumer protection areas as far as fraud and our ability to go back and see uh, who is the provider of this information, what type of input do they have. And all of those are kind of uh, limited because of Section 230. And so that's why our proposal uh, I tend to agree with what Professor Frank said about if you start piecemealing it, you really create an unwielding type of law. Uh, so what the National Association of Attorneys General proposed in their uh, May 2019 letter was simply in Section E, or subsection E, adding language that said not only federal uh, pro ability to prosecute, but also state and territory. So we're only adding three words that allowed us to enforce our state laws in this area. And um, I, I frankly think it's a pretty simple solution. It doesn't start piecemealing, but just gives us the state laws that we do have and allow us to enforce those. Because what, in the five years, the acceleration of online crimes has become significant. Mm -hmm. And particularly online crimes that affect young people uh, with a variety of apps where, uh, frankly, they become um, the targets. And so I think it's really important that we be able to enforce those laws because there's a certain threshold where federal prosecutors are just not going to be engaged in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to have the ability and not to have uh, some of the online providers who we feel are culpable or have aided or abetted the crime. They shouldn't be able to say, well, you're simply a uh, state and we're, we're immune by Section 230. <laughs> that the crime is increasing and that being allowed to prosecute at the state level would be helpful. Are there challenges that you've seen on the law enforcement end in addressing this activity online? Um, I, I asked our law enforcement people the effects of Section 230. Actually, it's, it's interesting because I think in some of these uh, online platforms from a criminal perspective, we've had some pretty good cooperation. We had a really um, uh, vicious murder case where the person uh, connected up through Tinder. And Tinder was actually very helpful to law enforcement as they did their investigation. Uh, we also have some other cases in which um, Google or other companies have made us aware of activity that we've been <coughs> able to prosecute, particularly in the child pornography area. So I would say that uh, there are good actors who have worked with us and provided us important information that have allowed the law enforcement to do a better and more thorough investigation and, and get the ultimate prosecution. Great. Well, Mr. Shear, your organization represents a number of large and small companies that would qualify as interactive computer services under Section 230. Can you take a moment to talk about what online platforms are currently doing to address the types of online harms that the other panelists have highlighted? So let me start by saying thanks to the department uh, and the FBI for bringing us together today to talk about this issue. Um, just in our sector of the industry, there are well over 100,000 personnel focused on these kinds of trust and safety issues that we're talking about day-to-day uh, -day working to stamp out bad actors online. Uh, the large services in many cases have developed uh, elaborate and sophisticated technological tools which certainly cannot solve all problems but are one tool in the toolbox in addressing these and those tools are frequently made available to others in industry. Additionally, the industry participates with organizations like NICMIC and the Internet Watch Foundation. There are inter-industry groups like the Technology Coalition uh, and in other areas, uh, the GIFCT, uh, hash sharing consortiums and, and a variety of other uh, private sector initiatives that work to, to address these issues. Um, 
you know, as, as we've heard, there are uh, tens of millions of reports made available to law enforcement uh, in order to assist in, in stamping out these activities. Uh, there's, there's no question that more investment can and, and should be done in this area. Um, but that goes not only for industry, but, but government as well. You know, I hear uh, industry finds that many of the cases that they refer to law enforcement aren't actually actioned. And when we're talking about tens of millions of reports, uh, if you look at the, at least as I read the statistical tables of the federal judiciary last year, there were fewer than 1,500 cases brought. So uh, it seems that more can be done with the, the efforts that are already underway, and we just need to figure out how to optimize that investment to to stamp out these kinds of problems that I think we all agree need to be addressed. Why do you know we've heard uh, about some some <coughs> companies that are taking efforts to moderate their content, to report to NCMEC and to report to state and local authorities? Why do you think companies are making these efforts? Well, obviously, no one service to be used for unlawful activities. If you're offering a service to the public, you want to ensure that that is. Uh, a clean, well-lit place, independent of whatever uh, legal obligations one has. Uh, that is the, the commitment that industry has makes to its constituents. Now, I, I, I won't say that there are uh, no bad actors out there who do, on occasion, uh, try and claim that these protections apply to them. There are a number of cases that illustrate that online services who, who induce, who contribute to, who solicit, who participate in the contribution <laughs> of, of unlawful or problematic content uh, themselves become a publisher and have no protection under Section 230. So where we have scenarios where the service is actually inducing the creation of this content, Section 230 does not apply, nor should it. And so uh, we need to ensure that in cases where there are bad actors who are claiming a protection that they don't have, that, that the litigation bears out that they should not receive that protection. You're not a publisher, but you're a bad Samaritan in the sense that you report nothing to NCMEC and you report nothing to state and local uh, authorities, even though you have knowledge that probably some uh, pretty terrible things are happening on your platform. Um, should the industry set some standards itself to um, police those bad actors? Uh, you know, there is a, a role for the industry to play here in identifying uh, some you know, baseline practices, and much of that, as I said, is, is already going on. Some of the, the larger firms in industry have gone well above and beyond legal requirements for, for compliance for over a decade here. So, there's, there's no question that a lot of that is already occurring. As I said, certainly more, uh, more can be done, um, but I don't think we should assume that the, the misconduct of a few bad actors is generalizable across a large industry. Does, does Section 230 mean that companies are not obligated to remove some of the harmful content that you're seeing? Does Section 230 mean that um, companies, whether they be uh, good Samaritans or bad Samaritans, are not obligated to remove har harmful content, content when they're aware of it? So most companies that are defined as an electronic service provider, which is going to be a subset of the interactive service providers, um, as we have under 230, have a separate reporting obligation when they become aware of apparent child pornography, again, just speaking to our mission, to make a report of that content to NCMEC's cyber tip line. But under 230, um, a, a company, as I read the immunity to moderate content under C2A, a company can um, choose to moderate or not. Um, they, they're protected if they moderate in good faith and remove, um, again, obscene, violent, or otherwise objectionable content. But they can just as easily choose not to, or they can choose to moderate uh, sporadically or only as to certain content. And, I think what we've seen a little bit while, uh, you know, in 1996 when that incentive was added, um, I, I think it uh, probably was done with great promise um, that the a rather small group of platforms that existed 24 years ago um, would actually utilize that in, in a really robust fashion. But I, I think the incentivizing promise of um, the content moderation immunity has become a bit aspirational today. And I think that's what 
um, you know, we're seeing is that there are companies, as, as Matt indicated, many of them are our closest partners, um, some of them are in the room today also, do tremendous work to go um, above and beyond the legal standards. But then there are others that um, not only are not proactive, but really turn the other way in, in, in a type of conduct that could be reckless as to the harm suffered by children on their platforms. And Professor Klonak, you teach internet law at St. John's University. Your research center is on law and technology, and you've written extensively about this topic. And most importantly, you've studied how platforms <coughs> and tech companies actually build their policy and their product. When did the industry recognize that there was a problem on its platforms, or when should it have recognized that there was a problem, and what did it do about that? So yeah, I just want to make a disclaimer that I, I do not represent any of the tech companies. I have uh, studied the major tech companies, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, YouTube, and Twitter, um, focusing predominantly on Facebook. Um, and that said, I don't focus predominantly on um, illegal content like CSAM is um, or things like that. I look at what I would term harmful content that stays in the platform content that the platforms have decided goes against their community standards or the values of their company. Um, and just to make a quick distinction, uh, there's a huge difference, I think, uh, between uh, these the top three or top five companies uh, and a lot of the sites that have been discussed today from Backpage to the revenge porn sites that um, Professor Franks mentioned. Um, they have different incentives. In so the type of um, stuff that they want to keep up and the type of content that they want to take down. Um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, all of these major sites really seek to make their platforms more or less, specifically Facebook, um, uh, what people want to see while they kind of eat their breakfast in the morning. And so there is a lot of, there's a lot of um, incentives in place for them to remove incredibly harmful content that appears on their site. Um, one of those is economic. Uh, it is really bad uh, press, um, and it drives users away from using the platform every time this types of, type of content stays up and there it gets into the media. The other is that ad pr people that buy ads on these platforms do not want to see their ads run next to um, a child uh, sexual abuse material or a sex trafficking ad um, or even um, non-consensual uh, non um, intimate images. So. That's actually, I think, a big part of um, the story that gets forgotten, which is that there is a moment of tech lash happening right now in which um, it seems easy to kind of gang up on the platforms and there's plenty of harms that they're creating and plenty of wrongs that they're doing. But in this particular area, I mean, basically since 2008, Facebook um, has been incredibly robust at developing a very rigorous set of rules and processes um, and systems around updating policies that responds to its users, specifically in order to avoid these types of problems. Um, and so just kind of getting rid of kind of that false di dichotomy of all tech and all platforms and all apps versus, um, versus law enforcement, I think is an important distinction to make. Can I real quick, Beth? Of course. Just as an example of, of how the industry can respond in that way, um, the Attorney General in Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, had the uh, Tree of Life uh, synagogue mass shooting of uh, 11 people who were killed. And that uh, defendant was using a, a site called Gab. And in fact, just before he took off, he put kind of a final mm -hmm. uh, comment there. And uh, it's is interesting because I know General Shapiro was looking, his office was looking at possibly Gab's uh, engagement, how proactive were they or uh, involved. Uh, but the industry started moving so quickly. PayPal took them off, um, I think, GoDaddy. Uh, several of their internet significant partners cut the line to them. And frankly, by the time that was done so quickly by the industry in response, um, there really wasn't anything to go after, as I understand it. If I could, you know, sort of follow on with that, it's it's really critical to understand that those decisions that were made businesses who chose to cut off a bad actor are themselves protected by Section 230. And Section 230 allows a service provider who might be providing uh, DNS protection, domain hosting, payment services, or any other variety of 
uh, products or services online to say to a bad actor, hey, we think you are inducing or participating in wrongful conduct, and, and we don't want to do business with you anymore. Now, normally, uh, that, that bad actor might have a, a breach of contract claim. They might be able to say, hey, well, wait a minute, we had a deal here. You, you've got to, you know, you agreed to support me, um, even though, you know, you now think that our, our service was participating in the creation of white supremacist content that's inducing violence. Well, Section 230 protects those good actors who are cutting off the bad actor, uh, and they can act more quickly in this situation precisely because they have that protection. So if we undermine that protection, it means that the good actors in the industry may have disincentive to cut off the bad actors. Mr. Connick, I could just respond to that in particular. Um, <laughs> I, I saw that coming. <laughs> I think it's very important that we distinguish between C1 when we say Section 230 protects that, right? So C2, as was discussed this morning, is the aspect that says if you do take positive steps to affirmatively moderate content, you will be immune. And that is very, very important. And I think most people would agree that C2 is not the problem. C1 is the problem. And so there's a bit of a sleight of hand to say Section 230 does this, because what Section 230 C2 offers and encourages is taken away by C1, because all incentives that any platform is going to have to actually act like a good Samaritan is taken away by C1, which tells them it doesn't matter if you don't. If you're not going to face accountability for your actions, what possible incentive do you have to actually act like a good Samaritan, especially if it comes out of your pocketbook? So in other words, we can talk all day about the fact that there are some social media platforms that have grown a conscience. I think we should also notice that they grew that conscience after advocates and victims came forward and made them grow a conscience in public. So the fact that we're trying to say that they have done good work, yes, some of them do good work in response to the people who are actually doing work on the ground to call attention to these harms and abuses. Harms and abuses that could have been avoided in the first instance had these products, and they are products, been designed in a way that was less negligent. So we can praise them for that and say there are some good actors, at least relative to the very, very bad actors that are out there, but why should that be the conversation we're having? Why should any of us have to throw ourselves at the mercy of a corporation to make sure that we are not going to have our most private intimate images distributed without consent or become victims of a mass shooting or have a firearm sold to a domestic abuser who's going to commit a homicide. We shouldn't be dependent on the fact that today some social media companies have decided for PR purposes or something else that they are going to take some steps. Congratulations for doing the bare minimum of what you could have done. What we really should be thinking about is how it is that C1 does not actually do anything to actually encourage these companies to do better jobs. And I do want to take issue too as a descriptive matter of you know, these platforms or these major companies uh, are not engaged in this type of behavior. They want clean, well-lit places. Ask any non-consensual pornography victim whether she considers Google to be a clean, well-lit place, or Twitter to anybody who's been attacked per perhaps by a public official on Twitter and harassed in the wake of that. Ask them how clean and well-lit that happens to be. So I think it's very important for us to notice, and this is back to the theme of cyber civil rights, notion of civil rights being, of course, that some people have always had rights. Some people have always enjoyed privacy and free speech and the ability to make money. The point of the civil rights movement is to ask who's being left out. And if we're looking at an online civil rights movement, we can look at how, yes, some people are having a great time on the internet. It's fantastic for them. Of course it is, right? It's fantastic for corporations. It's fantastic for white supremacists. It's fantastic for misogynists. The question is, who else is it for? Who else is the internet supposed to be for? So I would very much take issue with the descriptive account that, by and large, 95% of the internet is a good place, and it's just these dark areas where bad things are happening. That is simply not the case, at least for many people people who I think would probably object to the idea of having the privilege of being able to pretend that that part of the internet doesn't exist or is not a reality for some of the people who are um, subjected to that abuse or subjected to those violations of their rights every single day. Mr. Klonick made the point that um, for some of these companies, um, economic incentives may align very well with content moderation and taking down some of the worst of the worst. But um, it has to be the case also that for other companies, uh, the economic incentives align for just the opposite. Um, and what do you do about um, those companies where there is a, you know, a market for revenge porn or a market for child sexual exploitation material? What about those? Yeah, I actually, I actually agree with Mary Ann that there is um, that 
uh, there are certain types, and I agree with her initiatives towards the Shield Shield Act in particular, that uh, there is a vast majority of things that can start to happen uh, within these uh, within both both regulation and within the companies to better address uh, these harms. But I just wanted to kind of back up and, and to Marianne's point from the very beginning, can you be brought us back to the very beginning of like when they could, people could have been, or tech companies could have been doing more from the very outset. Um, I just, I, I do think this is a uh, massive norm setting period in which we do not understand exactly how to to what to make of all of the things that are happening um, and all of the technology that's um, kind of coming out. And by the time we finally figure it out, the technology has moved forward again and everything that we thought was true is no longer true. I mean, that doesn't stop, for example, the harm that's created by non-consensual pornography or what the tech companies could have done about it. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to address that, but I just do think that there is a, um, a massive amount of concern around acting really quickly in this space, um, and there's it's hard to know because of where the technology is headed exactly uh, exactly what the ramifications of that type of regulation might be. Here's, um, do you want to respond to some of these comments, and does Section 230 properly address public safety? Certainly. So I, I, I want to first respond to the notion the, the elaborate trust and safety programs that I was referring to recently are, are a, a, a somehow a new initiative, right? M most firms that we're talking about here have, have these kinds of programs set up from day one. They're, they're, they're prepared to, to engage with law enforcement. A lot of the programs and initiatives that I referred to previously are, are over a decade old. Uh, so the industry's efforts to stamp out bad actors online long predate uh, any, any recent instance of bad press. It's just a, a part of doing business is being a, a, a good corporate actor. Now, that's not to say, as I said, that there aren't uh, a few bad actors who participate in the conduct and then wrongfully claim protections that they're not entitled to, but they are uh, a small minority. As I said before, more can and should be done here, and that includes both in industry and, and on behalf of government. I think Section 230 creates exactly the right response, uh, the, the incentives, because it allows industry to set these programs up and to police content broadly across all the types of risks that we've been talking about without the fear that doing so will bring liability upon them. Now, we should talk, I, I, I can see that there's, there is, uh, hasn't been enough discussion about C1, which does create separate problems, right, which is, uh, what happens for uh, services that are, when, when content is not taken down, right? If we just got rid of C1, we would see uh, removal on, on, as a result of every possible complaint, because that would be the incentive. Don't leave things up, take things down when you get the complaints. And, and that runs the risk of itself having civil liberties concerns, right? We would see broad over-enforcement in response to concerns, marginalized voices, unpopular communities, perspectives that aren't mainstream would be subject to takedown because that's the incentives we would create. And we actually see this in jurisdictions where uh, the incentives are structured that way. There's, there's far more takedowns uh, where there is less protection for that discretion to protect what might be a lawful but unpopular viewpoint. And so we don't want to set up a, a situation where, where we're we're building a, a sort of a heckler's veto into the liability system, and, and unpopular viewpoints can be shouted offline. Now, that, that requires some balancing. It's, it's hard to do perfect. There are going to be missed calls, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should upset the entire system that allows that decision-making to occur. More can and should be done. What does that look like in your view? Well, as I said before, uh, the amount of report go to the, the law enforcement community versus the amount of prosecution, there appears to be some, um, some asymmetry there. But within industry, the, the kinds of uh, inter-firm efforts that uh, I described more can be, can be built upon. Uh, industry is constantly innovating around tools that can be shared with some of the smaller firms in industry who don't have those kinds of resources. And that's certainly something that I think we want to uh, continue to do. Uh, at the intergovernmental level, I know industry is engaging not just with the United States, but, but IGOs 
uh, around the world. I, I've been participating in an experts group with uh, the OECD where a lot of firms are, are working constructively with the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, to try and figure out how to, how to measure these kinds of problems, how to best respond to them. So there is a lot happening that, that might not be, you know, making it into the, the newspapers every day. Uh, but those efforts are underway and, and will continue them. Ms. Soros, a, a recent New York Times article said that reports of online sexual abuse material grew by more than 50 percent last year. It said this growth was an indication that many of the world's biggest technology platforms remain infested with the illegal content. How is there still so much of this material being traded using these services, given that there's um, all of this work done and norm setting being done? Thank you for, for that question, because I think it picks up on a few things that Kate said and also that Matt said. There is a tremendous amount of work being done by a few companies. Um, and, and we can debate kind of what that number is. It is the largest companies. That typically, the largest companies are um, the best and have made the commitment at finding the worst content on their platforms and screening for that, removing it in a sophisticated way, and reporting it. Um, but you know, once we drop off of the top four, five, six largest companies, we, we all know who those are. Um, and again, those companies do a tremendous job, but there are thousands and thousands of platforms around the world, um, chat, messenger programs, social media platforms, file sharing programs, the list is will continue to. Um, and, and just want to pick up, um, I, I think we, we heard a little bit of, of discussion around you know, the, the volume of uh, cases and the heckler's veto. We heard a lot about that this morning and the 10,000 duck bites. Um, I, I just think it's really important to keep in mind, um, and speaking as, as a child advocate here, when we talk about 100,000 duck bites, I know there is a business cost to that, but there is a person who has been harmed online behind every single one of those quote unquote duck bites. And I think we need to think when we use that kind of um, terminology um, around the, the business or the litigation burden of those cases, what and who is really standing behind those causes of action. Well, one of the you know concerning things is really the scope of this, the number of <laughs> images, the number of videos of CSAM, revenge point, things like that you're seeing. Is automation and in artificial intelligence uh, the answer? to removing illegal and harmful content? And is it especially the answer because small businesses, uh, maybe not the five largest companies, uh, say that they disproportionately bear the burden of um, more difficult content moderation? I mean, I think as far as AI and, and machine learning, um, you know, we have been very supportive of companies who are looking to test um, those types of technologies in connection with CSAM. Uh, I, you know, I think we all hope that it, it will have tremendous promise to assisting with content moderation. From our view, we are simply very, very far away from a point in time where that will turn the tide or where that will really eliminate the proliferation of these images online. Mm -hmm. and for, uh, Mark Zuckerberg says that AI is five to ten years away. Uh, why is it so long? And um, you know some of the numbers, hundreds of hours of video uploaded to YouTube every day, 500 million tweets per day. Uh, is this an impossible problem, or is it just a question of resources? 
the questions while we're listening to Mark Zuckerberg about anything, but one of the answers would be um, that, that there's always going to be a response from the tech industry about what is just around the corner that's going to fix this. But a lot of that, of course, is just a way of avoiding the question, which is these are human judgments that have to be made. Law is a human judgment. The idea that an algorithm is going to save us or that tech is ever going to save us from tech is ridiculous. And so what we actually have to start doing is to stop sort of paying attention to the illusion that we have some control over this because the next tool is right around the corner that's going to help us. We're avoiding the problem, which is structural and which is a design problem. So we can talk about whether or not it's been a decade or whether it's been five years, neither of which is very much time because the internet has been with us for some time, whether that's been soon enough for these companies to start belatedly saying, oh wait, people are dying and getting raped and getting poisoned and dying from um, uh, conspiracy theories and are losing themselves to propaganda. Oh wait, we'll try to do something about that now. The thing is, this is the world that Section 230 built, the one we're living in today. And so I think it's worth asking ourselves, all of us, whether we individually think that we're living in the best of all possible worlds. This is the product of Section 230. This is the product of Google and Facebook. We are living in their worlds. And that is the world in which, yes, the heckler's veto of a different sort dominates because it means that only the people who are not going to be harassed and sent rape threats and death threats are the ones who are able to speak the most freely. It has never been the case that the internet has become a space where marginalized communities can suddenly get their voice. They are being driven offline precisely because there are no incentives and very few laws that are in place to stop the kinds of harmful abuses that they're experiencing every time they speak from happening. So what we need to think about is how we got here and why it is that we're suddenly, or why it is that we're so treating the tech industry so differently than we would any other industry. Imagine the responses to any other industry where we'd say, oh, you've been putting toxic products out into the system for 20 years now and many people have died, but you're now going to start putting stickers on it or something like that. I mean, we would be more upset about the idea that an industry essentially gets away with it putting faulty products out into the stream of commerce and then saying, well, I guess we'll fix it later. And I'll use a specific example to illustrate that. Facebook Live, right? So Facebook Live um, comes under some controversy a few months after it is launched because guess what? People using live streaming services to do things like live stream murders and, uh, and rapes. And what does Zuckerberg say about that? We just didn't think that people would use it for that. You didn't think that they would use it for that? Have you ever been on the internet? The idea that anybody in this day and age would say, we put out a product and we weren't sure about the fact that bad people were going to do bad things with it, that is completely unacceptable as an answer today. It was an unacceptable answer 20 years ago, honestly. So if we're going to really take stock of where we are, we have to take stock of the fact that for more than 20 years, an industry has been told, unlike basically any other industry, with the possible exception of the firearms industry, that you're basically going to be immune from all the harm that you're going to cause, and you can pocket all the cash you want from that. And then that where any of us are surprised that this is where we've ended up, there's no reason to be surprised by this. The only question is, how long are we going to let that continue to be the case? The thing is, we really should not be looking to the tech industry to answer questions about how serious the problem is. We all know how serious the problem is. Experts know how serious the problems are. Of course the tech industry is going to say, but on balance it's all good. That's not the way we let most industries handle things. Maybe it is I up could to the public. Jump in here at some point. Uh, maybe. And, and <laughs> but <laughs> the, the point with, being with an that, eye towards answering the question that was asked. Which but was, the point being what that is technology going to do here? The industry, that the industry is going to keep telling us that there are going to be tools that they can use later, and that's all very well and good. But the question is, at the end of the day, the law is in place, because law is all about incentives. Laws are about how do you change human behavior for the good, because we cannot presume that people are going to do good on their own. And what so, we have seen after and what we have seen after these many years of producing the world that we live in now is that things have failed in the way that they have been done so far. And yes, we should be looking for new opportunities, but we always have to consider the fact that at the end of the day, it is human judgments, it's human assessments of what should be allowed and what should not be allowed that are really going to be the answer. Okay. I think Professor so, Klonick wanted to respond, and then Mr. Shears. Certainly. Okay, I just, I agree with, um, with everything you said, Marianne, except uh, to, to cite Balk's first law of the internet, everything that you see on the internet that makes you mad is everything that makes you mad about humanity. That is exactly what you just said, and that's kind of the, the reason that we are here today. This isn't, the, the, this isn't that 
Mark Zuckerberg didn't murder a person in Cleveland. He didn't murder any of these, you know, he didn't commit these rapes. What he did was he made them transparent to everyone. And he created a transparency to everyone that we can see how terrible we all are, okay? And now you want the tech companies to clean it up for you, okay? And that's an interesting problem, but that is the rule of law problem, and that is a systems problem. But I just want to like point out that this is, that there's a delineation here between what it is exactly the tech companies are doing, which is not to make murder a product. It is to surface human action that has already taken place. Mr. Shears. So the, the question... To, to take us back in time to the, the question was about <laughs> what, what role technological tools play here. Uh, and I think that's a really important question because sometimes technology is, can be held out as, as, a, as a sort of a, uh, a perfect solution. And we know that while technology is a, a tool in the toolbox, at the end of the day, the solutions to problems that people have are other people. Technology can help, but it's, it's not a cure-all. Uh, and, and when we talk about technology arriving, you know, in 10 years, the, the efficiency and the success rate of technology is a, it's a, it's a journey, not a destination. And so it's being used right now today. Lots of AI and machine learning based tools are deployed as we speak to, to stamp out these problems. They have error rates that, that are high but coming down. Uh, there are both false positives and false negatives, but they are being used. Those, those figures will decline over time and we will continue to use technology. But yes, ultimately this is going to require both technology and people because the problems that we're dealing with are problems that arise from people. So if I can speak I to that. What, what are your thoughts and then uh, I'll be uh, Just real quickly, <clears throat> with regards to the industry and the industry responding with technology and AI, what I would my observations in five years talk is cheap, deeds are precious. Um, and so when I see, for example, the um, Mississippi AG uh, have concerns about prescription drugs being, uh, youth being able to go on the internet and acquire prescription drugs, and some other concerns about access and, and brought uh, uh, investigation against Google and sent out numerous CIDs, um, Google responded by immediately applying Section 230 instead of addressing the issue and, and saying, well, um, we'll try to give you the best information we can, they, they threw up the defense immediately. And that's what I mean, talk is cheap, deeds are precious. That message to state AGs was that you're not going to see behind uh, our walls. And uh, they are actually, Google was successful at the uh, district court level and then at the um, Fifth Circuit, the court came back and said that the, the matter wasn't ripe, that they put the wall up too fast of using 230. So I just, I tire a little bit of um, the good intent uh, discussions because I hear them a lot. And I would prefer to see a little bit more of uh, cooperation. Well, well, General Peterson, some people say is fine the way it is because it has carve outs for federal criminal pr prosecutions. Why is that sufficient or insufficient in your view? We work with the uh, U.S. Department of Justice a lot, and what we do is I think we have the ability with state law, state criminal law and federal criminal law to complement one another. Human trafficking is a good example of that. There's a certain amount of uh, expertise that the U.S. Department of Justice can bring to that, but on a local level, um, we can deal with, frankly, smaller human trafficking operations, ones in which DOJ may not have the bandwidth to help us in a remote community in Nebraska where one person's trafficking out two girls because they're addicted to meth. So uh, we need to work hand in hand, and that's why I think our request to have states and territories, that simple language added in section, subsection E, is important because a lot of these operators are smaller time operators. Uh, you know, they've been referred to as a small time bad operators. We would have the ability to uh, address that from a criminal standpoint at a local level and work in conjunction with the federal authorities if it's a broader operation. So um, it seems to me to make good sense that we use both our uh, state and federal criminal prosecutors to do that. Back on to, uh, I think, what was a misunderstanding, although I'm, I'm surprised that the misunderstanding happened, 
no one is arguing that Mark Zuckerberg is responsible for murders that are live streamed on Facebook. That is a straw man argument. What is being argued is that there is a concept called collective responsibility, accomplice liability. That if somebody is murdering someone and we advertise it and we sell tickets to it and we pocket that profit, then that is a role that you are playing in that. And the idea that Facebook has somehow now been transforming itself into a social service that is attempting to highlight the evils of human nature, that's the first I've heard of that. I mean, it may be doing this unintentionally, but that is not what it's making its money off of. The point being that it's of course not the case that intermediaries are directly causing these harms. The question is what role are these intermediaries playing in promoting this harm, facilitating this harm, and profiting from it? Because if we weren't talking about the internet, if we weren't talking about online entities, we would have any number of settled principles in place that would assess those levels of responsibility. The greatest evils that we face in society are collective responsibility issues. They take a lot of people. It takes a village to harass someone and to commit a mass shooting and to promote non-consensual pornography. There are roles that people play. And just because someone happens not to be the direct actor, the person who fires the gun or who posts the image, does not mean that they don't play any role in the amplification of these incredibly serious harms that are silencing marginalized communities, that are getting people killed, that are making people sick. And that is the point. The call for action here from those people who think that Section 230 could be revised to do better is precisely this. Acknowledge the fact that accomplice liability exists for a reason and do not pretend as though everything that happens online needs to be dealt with a completely different regime than what we would have in the physical world. Well, Mr. Uh, the New York Times article I mentioned earlier uh, said that encrypted technologies allow predators to secretly trade child sexual abuse material. How do you see end-to-end -end encryption impacting your client's ability to monitor what is happening with their services and to ensure illegal content is not being enabled? Basically, is uh, even if, if serve these services wanted to take this uh, abuse material offline, by, by doing end-to-end -end encryption, aren't they saying, I'll give you everything I have, but I don't have everything, anything at all, because I can't see it? Right. The, the volume of reports that we talked about earlier suggests that, that that's, that's not, in fact, the case, that a lot of activity is going on. It's important to take a step back and recognize that unlawful and problematic content are not the only threats that digital services are trying to protect the public from today. There are a lot of threat vectors today that extend beyond problematic content, which is not to minimize the issues that we're talking about, but to acknowledge that there are other threats as well. Fraud, crimes, foreign adversaries are constantly threatening the users of these services, and other technological tools can be put into play to protect users from those threats. And one of those critical tools is encryption. The ability to ensure that users can communicate safely between one another ensures that they are not at threat from, from criminals and foreign adversaries who may want that information. I was just reading a, an article earlier uh, this week that was pointing out that uh, the 82nd Airborne deployed in Iran is using the end-to-end -end encryption app Signal, which is widely used by uh, individuals, civilians, journalists uh, for, for secure communication precisely because there's a concern that, that overseas compromised telecommunications networks could have uh, uh, military communications um, between government-issued devices be, um, be penetrated. And so those technologies are used for a variety of critical and, and lawful purposes. Um, yeah, as, as well as, as protesters, uh, civil, um, civil liberties advocates in uh, foreign jurisdictions that, that have problems uh, with the rule of law. And these aren't problems that we see here, but they are problems that we see in other jurisdictions. Um, and these kinds of tools are helpful there. So it, it is true that there is some uh, balancing that needs to be done between all these different tools. But, but make no mistake that encryption is, is one of the, the most uh, critical tools to protect users from crime that's in the marketplace today. Chris, do you want to respond to that? I know NCMEC receives 17 million alerts per year with 12 million of those from Facebook alone, uh, but that that could seriously go down after Facebook Messenger is completely encrypted. Yeah, th th yeah, a chance to respond to that. Uh, you know, from our point of view at, at NCMEC, we absolutely acknowledge that there are very um, serious military 
financial, personal health contexts in which end-to-end -end encryption is, is a necessity, is a security requirement. Um, but, but we really, we have to look at the other side of this. Um, and there, there are ways to balance in that. I was happy to hear you, you talk about it in the context of balancing interests. Um, from, from our point of view, looking at our 2019 numbers, as I said earlier, we received over um, 17, almost 17 million reports to the cyber tip line last year. And our estimate that um, is that if we were to be in an end-to-end -end encrypted environment for Facebook Messenger specifically, we would lose 72% of those reports, which is about 12 million reports. And you know, report numbers and percentages are, are really clinical in many ways to talk about. What that means um, is that children who are raped, sexually abused, enticed, um, subject to sextortion demands, in 12 million reports would continue to be abused, but would be undetected. Um, they would not be seen um, by the same way or at the same rate as the companies see them currently. Um, they would not be reported to NCMEC with any uh, substantial useful detail, and they, they simply would remain um, out there online abused and unrecovered, unrescued. And, and that's what's at the other side of the balance. And, um, obviously, you know, and Kate, you mentioned some, you know, important other interests on the other side. There simply has to be a compromise with how encryption gets rolled out. We can't lose 12 million children to abuse in that way. Professor Klonick, um, do you want to respond to that? Do you think this problem is going to get worse before it gets better, and is it time to start to look at making changes to Section 230? Yeah, I, I just want to talk about the end-to-end -end encryption um, thing real quick which is that it, it's an interesting story also about the growth of technology and this industry that, you know, there had we, I think, reached um, a, a, a we had a great res technological response to try to take CSAM off of browser, off of platforms through photo DNA that was pretty effective for a while. And what we, what we, I mean, people, what people who talk about this stuff and care about it have found is that then you have those communities move. Right? If you take them off of Facebook and Facebook groups and you click the deplatform them, this is the story of the deplatforming of anything, they move to other places on the internet and they, they narrow. They, the groups will get smaller, it's harder to find each other, but they will find each other and end to end encryption right now does protect bad actors against that. On the other hand, we've had the same exact problem happen with autocratic governments or law enforcement that's overzealous in certain places um, where they have learned to use platforms to to go after their own citizens and to surveil their own citizens. And so end-to-end um, -end encryption has saved those people too. And so those, I think, are the trade-offs that, um, that we have to kind of balance here. Um, and as the United States, I think we have a responsibility to think, as Matt said, about the full ramification of everywhere that these types of harms or these types of goods um, because of this technology are happening. Mr. Shear, should two did it at all? No. Certainly, the, the way the statute works today is as it was expected. I know we've heard a lot of uh, talk along the line. In 1996, we didn't anticipate X. You know, we thought that, that 230 was supposed to be for startups. But some of the largest advocates for Section 230 in 1996 were actually the large telecommunications providers. It's not a startup law. That's why libraries and public schools are, are, are written into the statute, because they, too, are a constituency that to take advantage of this protection. Uh, and it's, it certainly didn't not contemplate encryption, which you know, in the mid-90s, we were in one of the previous iterations of the crypto wars, where there's a, a, an anxiety that encryption is, is preventing law enforcement from doing its job. There are a lot of uh, sources of information that are available to law enforcement outside of encrypted communications, and that, uh, those avenues remain available to law enforcement. They, they may not be the first avenue that's thought of, they may not be the easiest to use, uh, but these tools are, as we've heard, critical for a lot of other uh, equally serious threats that, that we need to secure against. And so, you know, I think suggesting that Section 230 should be amended to deal with any of those issues is, is really uh, a mistake. General Peterson, you um, deal not only with child sexual abuse imagery, but with lots of crimes, um, some of the ones that Mr. Uh, Shears was talking about. How would amending Section 230 affect what you do? Well, I think our thought process was that our was pretty simple language. We weren't trying to remake. We were just saying, give us the ability to uh, enforce our own criminal laws. 
I'd like to put Matt on the spot and say, Matt, you didn't mean you wouldn't accept our amendment. <laughs> I'm happy to respond to the Attorney General, but I don't want to seize the mic if you weren't. weren't seize saying. it. Okay. It's okay. yours. <laughs> so, so I, I, it's, Section 230 does not prevent law enforcement by states. It prevents law enforcement action by states against interactive computer services when they are participating in the role of being an interactive computer service. So if that computer service is operating as a publisher, Section 230 doesn't apply. If they are the direct actor, actor Section 230 doesn't apply. It, it, law enforcement at the state level has a lot of opportunities here, but Section 230 does inhibit the ability to prosecute against <clears throat> Uh, businesses that are fundamentally interstate, and there's a logic to that, which is that these interstate services uh, should be dealt with at the federal level, so we don't have one state or municipality writing the rules for the entire nation. Right? I mean, we, that, there's a federalism principle there. Uh, and if the answer to that is, well, the feds don't have the resources to deal with that, then we should provide the resources for, for more federal law enforcement. So I take that as <laughs> um, <laughs> That, that was a no. <laughs> and, and, and I would push back to that because I do think there are actors, and we've talked about let's get rid of actors. Well, let us go after the bad actors uh, if we can show that they are aiding, aiding or abetting a criminal act. Let us use our criminal prosecution against them so we'll clean up your industry uh, instead of waiting for your industry to clean up itself. <laughs> But obviously we have a lot of uh, deep feelings and deep thoughts on this, and I very much appreciate the expertise of everybody on this panel. Thank you very much all for being here. And we'll have a
Shores. I am Associate Deputy Attorney General at the Justice Department, where I oversee the uh, review of market-leading online platforms that was referred to earlier. Um, the first two panels set the stage for this, our, our final third panel, which is entitled Imagining Alternatives, has been discussed. There's a variety of changes to Section 230 that have been proposed by commentators and legislators. Different procedural approaches have been proposed, ranging from legislative amendments to the cre creation of commissions, to the use of voluntary consensus standards, which I think we'll hear more about on this panel. And of course, to some, there should be no changes at all, and the status quo should be preserved. On this panel, we're going to explore the implications of Section 230 and potential changes for investment, competition, and speech. And fortunately, we've got a wonderful panel uh, with different viewpoints and expertise to help us explore these issues. So immediately to my left is Neil Chilson, and he's the Research Fellow for Technology and Innovation at Stand Together, which is part of the Koch Network. Uh, Neil is both a lawyer and a computer scientist, and he previously served as the Chief Technologist at the Federal Trade Commission. Next is Professor Eric Goldman. Uh, who's a professor at Santa Clara University School of Law, where he also co-directs the law school's High Tech Law Institute. Professor Goldman has written extensively on Section 230 and is going to share his views today, um, in addition to giving us a little tutorial before we get going. Uh, Pam Dixon is an author, researcher, and founder and executive director of the World Privacy Forum. In addition to her extensive work on privacy and consumer protection, Pam is an expert on voluntary consensus standards. Next to Pam is David Chavern, who's the president and CEO of the News Media Alliance, which represents approximately 2,000 news organizations across the United States and Europe. And next to David is Julie Samuels, who's the founder and executive director of Tech NYC, which is an organization that represents New York's growing tech industry. She previously was the executive director at Engine and a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So before we get the panelists' normative views of Section 230 and proposed changes, Professor Goldman, can you kind of level set the state of Section 230 and, and separate out for us C1 and C2 and just give us a state of the law, if you will? Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming today and for uh, sitting through the entire morning and sticking around till now. Um, I'm flattered to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about Section 230. Just to make sure that we're all clear on what it says, I'm going to help just uh, re recap some of what the statute does so that um, we're talking about the right parts in the right order. Um, Section 230 has two main operative provisions, Section 230C1 and Section 230C2. Section 230C1 shorthand summarize says that online services aren't liable for third-party content. Now, this sets up a classification between first-party content and third-party content. Section 230C1 doesn't talk about first party content at all. That's going to be subject to default laws. Um, but there's a special category of things called third party content that are protected by uh, the statute. Those, any liability based on that third party content should be covered. Um, and of course, the difference between third, first party content and third party content isn't always clear. And then we might have other questions about things like conduct as opposed to content and whether that would be covered as well. Section 230C2 actually has two subparts. Uh, subpart A basically says, I'm going to summarize, uh, that online services aren't liable for their good faith filtering decisions. So where they decide to block or remove content, that cannot be the basis of liability per Section 230CA2. Section 230CA, uh, sorry, C2B says that um, uh, that uh, providers of instructions for filtering decisions are also not liable for providing those filtering instructions. So C2 uh, has two different parts that sometimes get conflated, but the main that we were talking about this morning was this notion that if a site chooses to block or filter, that that blocking and filtering decision is the basis of liability. Um, there are four statutory exclusions to Section 230. There's the federal criminal prosecutions exclusion that was discussed uh, this morning. There's an entire exclusion for anything that's characterized as an IP claim. Um, there's exclusion for claims that are based on the Electronic Communications Privacy Act or state law equivalents. We don't see much action in that. Um, and then there's the claims that were newly created by FOSTA that relate to sex trafficking. Um, Section 230C uh, is a general proposition 
it has some notable characteristics of design that are different from other types of meetings that you're used to seeing. One is that there's no prerequisites. For example, in the copyright realm, in order to be eligible for the safe harbor, there's a bunch of prerequisites that a service must go through to be uh, um, uh, uh, protected from liability for third-party copyright infringement. There's no prerequisite for Section 230. Um, there's no scienter requirement in Section 230C1. Um, and so, you know, the questions about knowledge, um, what does a site know, don't come up under C1 litigation. Um, and the immunity, as we discussed earlier today, is not claim specific. It was, it covers a wide range of claims. And the way I tell my students, it covers all claims unless they're expressly enumerated in the exceptions. Um, there are a variety of common law exceptions that have developed over the years. So these are supplement the statutory exceptions. One of the most notable ones comes from the roommates.com case that said, among other things, uh, that um, uh, Section 230 doesn't apply when sites encourage illegal content or design their website to, cr to require the input of illegal content. And then there are certain claims that common law have excluded from um, Section 230's coverage. Uh, that includes uh, failure to warm claims, promissory estoppel claims, and possibly claims that are, uh, actions were taken based on anti-competitive uh, animus. Um, I hope that helps get a page on how I think about Section 230. That, that's very helpful, Professor Goldman. Neil, I know as part of your research, you've not only been thinking about Section 230 and its incentive structure, but also paying attention to proposed changes. And there's kind of a taxonomy of approaches you could take to intermediary liability and some proposed legislative uh, changes out there. Can you just give us an overview of those before we jump into some normative uh, sure, it's a lot of ground to cover, uh, but I'll do my best to do it uh, quickly. So big picture, when we're trying to, when we're considering how to address bad things that are happening online, there are of course uh, a wide range of options. We have criminal law, we have civil, civil law, uh, but the, we have some essential questions that we have to ask and answer before we uh, figure out what to do. And so first thing we have to ask and answer is what type of bad thing? Are we just talking about things that harm people? Or are we talking about things that are illegal already? Or are we talking about things that should be illegal? Um, we can talk about uh, who should be held liable. And that's a big chunk of the Section 230, 230 debate. I think you've heard that today. Um, is it the person doing the, the bad thing that we're trying to stop? Is it the provider of the tools doing that? Is it some mix of them? How do we distinguish them from each other? Uh, these are all the real questions that you have to grapple with when you're talking about intermediary liability. In what situations might the party be responsible? Is it always? Is it sort of a strict liability standard? Is it only if they uh, participated in the creation of the content or somehow contributed to that? Uh, is it when they have knowledge of uh, content being on their uh, on a uh, service that they offer? Um, is it when they were unreasonable about it? And finally, is there a way to uh, to recover the uh, the immunity from uh, prosecution in some of these cases? And and would that be? Is there an action that w that a company can take after they have notice or after they have some other uh, warning about? Uh, something and they can take that down. So this is a notice and take down uh, approach that I think has been referred to earlier as well. So this is a really wide range of options, uh, but lawmakers have to choose from ones that work with their context or legal context, uh, and, and you can kind of group these into three categories of concerns. There's concerns obviously around how do we prevent harm, and this is the harm that we might be trying to pass a law to protect against, such as child exploitation. Um, but it can be other types of harm as well. What is the, what are, how are we setting the incentives? That word has been used a lot today. How are we creating incentives? Uh, does it discourage moderation? Does it encourage moderation? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, does it incentivize more or less of the particular behavior that we're trying to stop? Um, the second category is how, how do we uh, protect speech and public participation? How do we expand that? Um, in the US, obviously, we have a very strong constraint on government's ability to uh, uh, force people to take content down, and that is uh, the First Amendment. And so uh, we have to work within that context in the US, uh, but other countries don't do that, and, and there are some consequences from that in those countries. Uh, but one of the major concerns here, and it's already been addressed a little, it's already been talked about a little bit, is the concerns around over-removal. Um, the the ideal, ideal outcome would be that we take down content that's illegal and we leave up the content that's legal. Uh, but how do we hit that goal? And it can be really hard to get incentives that align that way so that we don't end up taking down content that, too much content that is 
uh, that is legal and that should be up, uh, and, and we only take down content that's legal. Now, we want, and, and the, the other big question there is, uh, who makes that decision about whether or not content that's legal is allowed uh, to stay up? Public speech and uh, pu uh, speech and public participation, that has big implications for that, if you have companies who can take down speech, uh, even if it's legal. So uh, the third category is how do we encourage technical innovation and economic growth? And how does the approach uh, that we might take to addressing liability online, uh, how does it affect innovation? How does it affect in, uh, investment and competition? In particular, does this disadvantage people who use certain business models but compete against other types of business models? Uh, how, how does it play out in that space? And I, I hope we'll dig into that one uh, a little bit since we're at the DOJ. Um, and uh, finally, does it increase or decrease legal certainty around these issues? Um, so there's been, a, uh, there's been a lot of talk, and we've heard some proposed uh, changes to Section 230 discussed today, but there's not a ton of legislation, um, which makes it easy sort of to grapple with uh, if you want to talk about it. And so I'll just quickly mention the kind of, I kind of classify them into two big buckets, maybe three big buckets. There's a sort of exemptions, carve-outs approach. Uh, there's, this is something like uh, Ed Case's Plan Act, which focused uh, explicitly on home sharing sites and uh, how Section 230 protects or doesn't protect them. Uh, there, then there's what I would, might call uh, bargaining chip proposals. And, and these are uh, essentially say, uh, the internet can keep Section 230 protections or companies can keep Section 230 protections uh, if they do X. And so, um, you know, we had uh, Senator Hawley's uh, proposal for, uh, it's called the Ending Support for Internet Censorship Act, which would condition Section 230 on convincing FTC commissioners that a site's content moderation was neutral, politically neutral. And then there's the Earn It Act, which we actually, we haven't, we don't have uh, released language on this yet, but um, wh which proposes essentially that uh, a commission, as I understand it, a commission chaired by the AG would help define what that X might be. What do companies have to do in order to keep uh, Section 230? And so, uh, so that's, that's kind of the landscape as I see it, the dimensions that uh, people need to consider when they're uh, thinking about these questions, and I look forward to the discussion. So that's the landscape. Let's find out what the answers are. Um, and David, why don't we start with you? And a lot of questions um, that Neil's put on the table for us, but maybe step back and pro provide the perspective of, of your industry on Section 230 and the possible changes that have been proposed. Sure. Um, and thanks for the setup. I th I, before <laughs> we get to answers, I'm going to complain a little bit first, if that's okay. Um, Listen, Section 230 um, was a very unusual legal protection that was designed to nurture a pretty new and really unformed Internet environment uh, that's become essentially a huge market distortion that benefits a few actors uh, and to the detriment of many other actors. In particular, it fundamentally acts as a punishment for folks who are willing to take responsibility for their content. Now, talking about my members, my members are news publishers. And they've been responsible for their content since about the 1730s, OK? So we're going on 300 years. And interestingly, being responsible for the content was not a hindrance to our growth as an industry. Uh, we actually figured out a way to, for a lot, many centuries, uh, make money and be accountable, which apparently is a novel concept at the moment, but that we were, <laughs> we were pretty good at. Um, in, in the, as we go into the, um, uh, you know, fundamentally, most of our readers are online, um, and we've got more readers than ever, even though the financials of the industry are worse than they've ever been. Uh, and where 230 plays into this uh, is a couple different areas. First of all, our content is subject to extreme editorial control uh, by uh, the major platform companies. When you look for, when you look, by the way, if you look for news online, Google News, what you see is different than what I see. Somebody has decided to surface content for you that's different than the content for me. Uh, and that may be some of my members' content. It may be uh, crazy, outrageous, viral content. Uh, but there is decision-making there that's commercial decision-making by the platforms, 
which, by the way, I don't — it's really the whole value of their business. I mean, these are the exact opposite of passive or dumb pipes. Their, their whole business value is in their ability to make these amazing algorithmic judgments about content and advertising. Um, but it's their judgments, and for which they should then have responsibility. I don't know why it's uh, — why they need exemption for their commercial activity. They also make decisions about reach. If there's — you may have an actor who makes, makes a slander uh, to somebody else uh, that has relatively little impact, and again, if it were to happen on the street, have no impact whatsoever. But then there's a separate decision about reach, about who gets to see that. And is it 10 people or is it 10 million people? And that's the decision of the platform. That's, again, their commercial decision for which they should have responsibility. It's not up to the rest of us to, uh, to have responsibility for that. And there's also the issue, which hasn't been talked much about today, which is anonymity. Um, some of the platforms, uh, you know, have anonymity as, as of the users as part uh, of their package. And again, that's their commercial decision. But that also is a design factor uh, that prevents this going after the speaker kind of uh, uh, redress that's often justified for 230. If you, if you can't find them, uh, then how do you get uh, redress for, for, the, uh, for the speech? And frankly, if you're a journalist these days, part of your job is being abused online all day. And if you're a female journalist, you get abused twice as much or five times as much. And that is the life of a journalist today uh, for which there is no redress. The people just expect it to be part of the business. It shouldn't be part of the business. So um, what we ultimately have to do is figure out how we're going to build back into these systems incentives for quality, incentives that reward people who take responsibility, who invest in good quality content, and those who don't. I was interested that uh, Mark Zuckerberg referred to that there's somewhere between a newspaper and a telecom company in terms of how we should think of them from a regulatory perspective. And that's actually pretty insightful. I mean, there's, you know, are they the passive pipe or are they editorial? They're kind of a little bit of both. Uh, what they can't be is neither, okay? And if being in between means you're not subject to any of the rules, then that's not the right outcome. And, and finally, I, I would note, listen, these are great companies. They do amazing things. Um, I, I do — I'm not super impressed by the defense of, we get billions of pieces of content. How could we possibly deal with it? They built it. They make the money from it. God bless. A lot of rich people doing a lot of rich stuff. But that's not my problem. <laughs> that's not our problem. That's, the, that's their business uh, and their problem. And fundamentally, we have to get this whole ecosystem back to uh, aligned incentives for quality uh, and, uh, and actions that do redress uh, abuse online. So with that, Ed, I'll pass it over, and then we can talk more about, uh, more about uh, options. Thanks, David. Um, Julie, what is the perspective of the tech community on Section yeah. 230 and these proposed changes? Um, I'm quickly going to talk a little bit about that and some of the normative things I see, and I'm going to take the, the time first to respond to a couple things. Um, but, you know, first I would say that as we think about kind of what the landscape looks like, as we think about where a lot of the companies I deal with are, um, I think it's incredibly important and instructive, and this has come up earlier today as well, to think through the lens of some of the smaller companies. Uh, we are spending a lot of time uh, in, as, a, as a nation right now talking about a handful of large platforms and what that means. And, and I would just say that uh, it is important that we as a society and as an economy incentivize competition in this space. Uh, I think we're having a very robust debate about the best way to do that. But one way undoubtedly to do that is to let companies compete. Uh, and, and I think that the 230 framework, um, and, and maybe it's not perfect, you know, I'm not up here saying that, but the 230 framework is crucial. Uh, and we've heard this earlier today, so I'm, I don't mean to harp on it, but, but we can talk about the costs for compliance with uh, all kinds of additional layers uh, of regulation in this space, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't regulate in this space, but we should be always thinking about what those costs look like uh, on, on players that aren't, you know, the small handful of largest companies who can afford to comply. 
Um, the other thing I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about, and, and when we think of this in context, I was so glad, I was actually so glad, David, when you brought up the 1700s, and when we think about these moments when there are giant technological shifts, you know, the reason the news industry grew in the 1700s was because of the printing press. Uh, that was a level of technology that allowed one to speak to many, and that was new. Um, and that's really interesting, and obviously has had, I, I mean, so much impact on society. I, I'm not an expert or a historian, but I, I don't think it, it takes one to really get your head around that at least a little bit. We are in one of those moments again. Um, it is a fundamental shift in so many ways. This is not the kind of thing that happens once a decade or once a generation. You know, this is a really big deal, how the kinds of technology we're talking about are impacting how we live. Um, I don't mean to sound trite, it's totally true. It's actually pretty amazing to be alive during this time. And now we have technology that allows, instead of one to many, many to many. And that's new. And as we think about what this looks like going forward, you know, I really worry uh, that we think somehow we can, you know, put the genie back in the bottle or whatever kind of corny phrase you want to use. Um, the way we communicate, the way we share information, the way we buy things, the way we interact is changing because of technological innovation. Uh, that is, you know, internet, mobile, that is fundamentally shifting so much about our society. And I hope that as we have this debate and as we dig in on some of these proposals, we're able to take it, and it's hard because you don't want to get it wrong when you're talking about people's lives. I'm not. I don't want to be glib, but we also don't want to pretend that there is an amazing opportunity uh, as a society. And it, it, it might mean that, you know, that the economy or certain industries don't work like they used to. And that might be hard, but it also might be okay. And I would just kind of leave that out there as a framework for thinking about this. Julie. Um, Professor Goldman and, and Neil, I want to go to you next. And both of you have signed on to a document setting out seven principles to guide lawmakers in considering liability for user-generated content online. So I want to get your general views, but also in, in the context of that, if you could provide some, um, some explanation of these seven principles. And Professor Goldman, why don't we start with you and then let Neil offer his comments. Um, I would like to talk about the principles, but actually only after some other remarks, um, if that's okay. Um, so, you know, I think one of the, the hardest uh, challenges here is to discuss uh, this question as a balancing act. Um, there's going to be costs and benefits on, on any decision that we make. And um, so what I hope to accomplish in this panel is to at least elevate some of the benefits that we're getting from the way that things are. and the technology uh, capabilities that we're developing. Um, that's not to at all marginalize or diminish the cost. It's about the balancing act and how are we going to strike the right balance. Get the best of the good with the least of the bad. Um, and, uh, and so I, that's really how I'm thinking about the framing for today's uh, discussion and especially for this panel. Um, the, it's, it's easy to overlook the benefits that we get from technology in part because Certainly, if you start with the, the later millennials um, and beyond, um, they never had a life without the internet. And um, they don't know what things were like back then, that us old guard type people remember, um, as the challenges that we faced. Um, and the internet just makes those problems go away. But it's easy to take for granted that that will always be the case, that the internet will just make all those problems go away. But a lot of what we're discussing is maybe, in fact, we aren't going to make those problems go away because the technology, the, the legal change will cause a change in the, the ability of the technology to solve those problems. Um, so, and for me, I think when we talk about um, what's new or different about today versus 1996 when uh, uh, Section 230 is passed, um, to me, I don't think that the, the, the benefits we get from Section 230 have changed in a material way. Um, certainly, um, we didn't know what the technology could do, and one of the goals was to preserve the freedom for that to develop, but I don't think we know what the technology can do even today. Maybe some of you are prepared to say, we've reached the end game of the internet. This is as good as it's going to get. From here on out, all change will be incremental and inconsequential. I don't think so, and if that's not the case, Section 230 preserves the freedom for us to continue to see how far we can go uh, with that technology. 
Um, Section 230 still solves the moderator's dilemma problem, the dilemma that if you try and fail, you're liable for what you missed, and so you have incentives not to try in the first instance. And that hasn't changed in the 25 years that we've had Section 230. We still have the moderator's dilemma as the potential risk, and Section 230 is still the solution to it. And finally, Section 230 was designed to keep markets open, to allow the new entrants to come into the market, and it still does that. It still lowers the barriers of entry so that new innovative services don't have to look like Google or Facebook in order to be able to enter into the market and potentially compete with them. Um, the, uh, the last thing I think I'm going to say, um, it really uh, relates to um, the, uh, the difficulty of the baseline. Um, the baseline isn't can we eliminate all harms online, um, because that's not the baseline we expect in the offline world either. Um, we, I think in the previous panel, there was some discussion about the internet as a mirror or as a uh, way of seeing what's going on in our society. The reality is people are awful to each other all the time, um, in the offline world and online. Um, and the internet uh, allows the mediation of human interactions in a way that might actually do better than the baseline offline world. So we can actually find ways for technologists to create ways to, for example, make us kinder towards each other. Some of you have, haven't seen that with, for example, Nextdoor. They have a kindness tool that's designed to help people recognize that maybe they're engaging in incivil behavior and they could do better. Um, Section 230 enables us to build the tools that are going to help improve the way in which we interact with each other, maybe help us actually elevate the overall level of discourse. That's what I'm uh, interested in making sure that we include in the Balancing Act. Thanks, Professor Goldman. Uh, Neil, why don't you pick up next, and I know you have some thoughts to offer um, on this issue as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, so big picture, I'll, I'll just touch on two points and then uh, save the rest for discussion. Um, <clears throat> uh, Section 230 is a, a focused law that embodies a clear and, I would argue, a relatively conservative principle of individual responsibility. Uh, in the simplest terms, and we've heard it explained a couple different ways today, but I'll just do it again. <clears throat> it holds individuals responsible for their actions online, not the tools that they use. Um, if this sounds really obvious to you, I think it's because it, it's the normal way we do things in the US. I, I thought. Uh, Professor Zaparsky did a really good job of laying out how tort law favors punishing the people who do bad things and not the intermediaries who are involved, uh, who, who might you know, be somewhat involved, but not, were not the actors, who were not the doers in this space. Um, so we hold newspapers, not newsstands, uh, liable uh, for their articles. We hold authors, not bookstores, liable for the content that's, that's published in books. And so we hold uh, social media users responsible, not social media platforms. <clears throat> By contrast, uh, intermediary liability essentially says we're going to hold one person responsible for the actions of another. And that's unusual under our laws for good reason. It can be uh, because blaming one person for something that somebody else did can be unjust and unfair. Uh, so we have to have really good reason to do that. So Section 230 is a, a focus law as well. Um, it applies only to third-party content. Eric did a great job of explaining that, so I'm not going to belabor this point too much. Um, but I do want to point out that you know, if you hear arguments, and we already have, that online platforms are the same as newspapers in some ways, please recognize that Section 230 does not immunize their content. So while the newspaper has, uh, industry has been uh, liable for the content that they have produced, for the last, since the 1700s, uh, Google is liable for the content that they produce today. Section 230 does not change that. <clears throat> but I want to dial it back a second and think about, uh, we're on a, a panel that's supposed to talk about competition, and uh, we're, we're going to hear uh, about the effects on big companies and on small companies. I want to talk a little bit about its effect on people, because I, I did think uh, Ms. McAdams made a really good point that what really matters is how the law affects people. And <clears throat> uh, these services right now, they connect people to each other on an unprecedented scale. Uh, they allow people to find people who have similar interests to them and to communicate uh, when they never could before. And that's because they lower transaction costs. They let people, they eliminate middlemen, and they make it possible for connections to form. So a little bit of a, the distribution of news is one type of connection, but it's only one type of connection. 
Uh, these platforms have enabled commerce, housing, transportation, communications, and even philanthropy that's user to user rather than going through an intermediary. And that's really different, and it's really big. Um, and it's really personal. So there's a bunch of uh, categories that don't fit here. So I have a little story. Um, I also have a little girl. Uh, she's seven months old. And when she was in utero, uh, she was diagnosed with clubfoot, which is a birth defect. Now, thanks to the miracles of modern science, uh, it's a mostly correctable defect, right? It's something that can be handled. But it's a long process, and it's really scary. And as first-time parents, my wife and I were terrified by this, right? And we had no idea what to expect. Our doctors were great, but they weren't there all the time. Uh, we couldn't reach out to them. And there were lots of things where it felt like, is this even the right thing to ask a doctor about, uh, about how we were feeling about it or how to deal with it? <clears throat> you know who was there? Was the, uh, the Clubfoot group on, on Facebook, the 5,000 plus people who had literally gone through this experience, right? And who had spent time in this situation. And, and any time, day or night, we could go to them with struggles and say, like, what, what should we do? And we, should get, we could get insights. And now that we're past the hardest part of that, we can contribute back into that group. That's the sort of thing that you can't build a business model around, right? Like that, just there's no monetary value in that sort of content, but it exists because of Section 230, because Facebook didn't have to vet every single uh, posting that was going in into that group. And I can't put a price on it, but I found it uh, extremely valuable. And I hope uh, we'll just remember that uh, Section 230 has a real effect on users uh, and individual people, not just on businesses and uh, big or small. So, Pam, let's go to you next. And I understand you take a middle ground view of this and are particularly interested in the process and how we could procedurally bridge the gap in some of the opinions on Section 230. Do you want to speak to those issues? I do. Thank you. So, you know, I do have comments that I wrote for this, and there's a lot of detail about something called voluntary consensus standards. I have four brief things to say, though, before I get there. So, what? So, first off, I am not an attorney. I um, am, however, a, a subject matter, matter expert in privacy as well as in data systems. So. I just finished um, a multi-year study, which is four years of sheer tedious torture, um, on FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And we looked at one aspect of FERPA, which was directory information. And prior to us looking at that, there was literally no data on implementation of FERPA, none. Well, the report's 225 pages, okay? So it really strikes me in observing this conversation today, and also in preparing for this for this talk now, that this area suffers from two twin problems. Number one, there was a fairly significant lack of systems thinking, and I'll get back to that. And number two, I find it to be quite under-researched as to fact patterns. And let me speak to this a bit. So first off, I want to talk about systems thinking. So when I opened the doors of the World Privacy Forum way back in the early 2000s, I was coming from the University of Denver School of Law, where I work with Richard M. Smith doing really super geek research and pings and all sorts of ridiculous things like that. It was great. But I hadn't been running um, that center, so I didn't know what to expect. When I opened the doors, literally the first week, we began a steady stream of people who called in with harms. and. Over 20 years, I can tell you something about those harms. They fall into about three or four categories, but I'm going to tell you the first two because they're interesting to this debate. The first category are people who are victims of domestic violence and people who have been raped and who are either fleeing from the person who committed that crime or just trying to save their life. And they have very specific harms. The second group of people who call are people who have children or who themselves have a genetic-based illness. A lot of the people who call tend to have Huntington's disease, which is a terrible disease to have, and they're having things based on that. But here's the thing. When I talk to these people, when other people at the organization talk to these people, it is so rare to find a situation where it's just one factor, one platform, one issue. It is a multifactorial problem. 
you have to do a systems analysis. Was there a public record? Was there an educational record? Was there a health record? What are you doing on the platforms? Which platforms? There's usually about 10. And some of them are big and some of them are small. Some of them are private. Some of them are not. What's the fact pattern here? So I see in the overall literature around this debate an overall lack of really significant fact patterning that really cuts across the boundaries. OK, so I'll stop torturing you on that. Um, I will mention something else. Um, I spent two years at OECD doing um, the, the principles on AI. And there were 30 of us in the room um, doing, the, doing the draft. And there's something that we all learned to do. We all learned that we were all right. We had different points of view, but we were all correct in our own way. And that leads me to uh, something beyond the fact patterns, which is the need to develop consensus in this space. It is OK to disagree. In fact, I think it's a rich and important thing to do. But can we possibly find areas of consensus? I, I have seen a lot of harms from my work at World Privacy Forum. And I can catalog them for you. And I can show you where they connect to the various ecosystems. And I can talk to you about how those ecosystems connect. And I have personally helped women change their identity legally to escape from those ecosystems so they can have a safe start with their kids. It's really hard to do. It takes like a year. <laughs> that's what the ecosystems are like. And that's really what this conversation is about. But is there something that we can all agree on? This is important because if we can find a way to agree, we will avoid the trust problem that we've really heard about all day. Individual users can lose trust in systems. Organizations can lose trust in systems. Systems can lose trust in other systems. And platforms can lose trust in government and vice versa. And jurisdiction can have cross-jurisdictional cross trust problems. It is in all of our interest to solve the trust problem. And that leads me to a potential middle pathway that, that I started working on several years ago. Um, in response to some of the intractable, prob intractable problems I was finding in my own work. So this is called voluntary consensus standards. Let's start with the first word, voluntary. These are voluntary standards. They are consensus standards. Consensus does not mean self-regulation. It means people come together, consensus is defined, and they are standards. So I've heard a lot today about how companies are agreeing to do more. Uh, more items that act, they are actually exceeding the standards of, you know, Section 230 um, and what is required for content moderation and other activities and reducing harm pulling content. But what what would happen if there was a slightly more formal process that was still voluntary that allowed all of the stakeholders in the ecosystem, not just the big guys, not just whoever's on the, the boiling pad for that moment. What if all of the identifiable stakeholders in that ecosystem could come together in a voluntary consensus process and find consensus on solving a discrete, observable, definable problem? I think that would be a good outcome. And I think that's an important middle way. Now, I do want to say, this is already part of the US statutory authorities. It's already been regulated by OMB in OMB Circular A119. And what this means is that this is not some ad hoc process that's, oh, let's just volunteer and get a group together. No, no. There, there, you have to have non-dominance. There has to be due process. There has to be redress. You can also. Um, there's a wonderful case study at the FDA where the Food and Drug Administration actually recognizes voluntary consensus standards. And as a result, the medical devices that each have a voluntary consensus standard get published. Pam, can I stop you there and come back to the details just so we'll have an opportunity to talk about some of the other issues? So, I know there's so a lot to say. Even though I'm not a law professor, <laughs> I told you I can hold my own. <laughs> indeed. I can indeed. talk a lot. 
Um, let's just go to the cost issue directly in small business, Julia, which you mentioned. Some of the proposals that have been put on the table have carve-outs for small and medium-sized companies, effectively, that would shield them from, from liability. Um, would that type of proposal give you comfort, you know, for the small tech yeah. companies? Or, uh, listen, or do you I think that would have the wrong incentives? I, I worry about carve-outs based on size. I think it's good. I understand why you would go there, and that's the kind of thinking that I generally support here, but it's tough. It's tough to draw that line in the sand. You also don't want to uh, carve out bad behavior. You know, just because you're small doesn't mean you're automatically good either, and I think that's an important thing to think about in this debate, and that's why this is tough. Uh, really quickly, one thing, when we talk about this kind of, like, uh, Swiss cheese approach, if you, for lack of a better term, um, for the small uh, startups in particular, it becomes really problematic because of the legal costs associated uh, with, with handling uh, all kinds of, usually it comes in the form of litigation. Right now, the way uh, 230 is structured is you can bring it up in a motion to dismiss, you can bring it up at the pleading stage, you can uh, get out of um, uh, non-meritorious litigation relatively cheaply. If that were to change for some of these small companies, it becomes incredibly difficult. Uh, I, there are a lot of people in this room I once worked with on patent reform issues, and that's what we saw happen there. You know, we had a cottage industry of lawsuits being brought against small companies, and that's not a good solution. So I, I worry about these, like, the, the creating all the holes for that reason. David, what's your to that. I know you've argued for a, an incremental approach, and, and that would suggest, you know, various exceptions, perhaps. What's your view? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, all these public policy issues, it's always hard in terms of line drawing. But I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, again, we're the only business mentioned in the First Amendment, and we were fighting for free speech a lot, a lot before that. So I'm not going to cede any ground to anybody on free speech grounds. But uh, and so uh, I think a careful incremental approach is, is justified. Um, I also think there are, frankly, just a few platforms that just matter a whole m lot more to society right now. I mean, that is a fact of life. Uh, the, uh, there isn't, and it's not all because of 230, but it's not like there's a lot of startup action in search or, uh, or social media. Uh, those are the dead zones, frankly, for for new uh, for new business development. Um, so, uh, you know, there with great scale comes great responsibility. There are a couple that just matter more, and I think it's not irrational to start with the ones that just matter more. But is there, uh, again, if you want to get into the perfect sort of uh, outcome here, then there won't be an outcome. Okay, so then that's an essentially a default argument to do nothing. Uh, Neil and then Pam, I think you had something to add on this. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it is interesting to think about the effect of a sort of threshold where you look <coughs> to apply one set of rules to people above that threshold and a different set of rules to people below that threshold because right now a lot of the concern in the, the competition debate, which DOJ is looking into, is around this kill zone idea that, <coughs> that if you uh, that, that these big companies acquire uh, smaller companies in order to stop competition, to stop somebody uh, from taking over their market power. Uh, if you have a threshold at which uh, you, you get, you know, three million and one users a month, all of a sudden you have to do, uh, you have to have an enormous content moderation uh, system or uh, face huge legal liability. There's no better way to get past that threshold than get acquired. So, so if you if you're worried about kill zones now, draw a line in the sand and say once you get too big, uh, we're gonna we're gonna put different rules on you. That's just gonna that's just gonna incentivize all these entrepreneurs to get acquired rather than try to compete to uh, compete for the marketplace. And I don't think that's really what we want to look at. Um, in addition, you know, I, I think David made the great point that. These, there's some big players right now. Uh, I would say, like you know, that those big players have not always been in place. In fact, most of them are, are younger than probably most of your members, David. And so, uh, so, so I think that they can, they can, uh, they can come and go. Uh, and and if we have competitive environments that don't cement their market power into place, uh, we have a better chance of that. And so, um, so I just wanted to raise those competition issues with drawing the sort of threshold. Uh, 
where you might apply liability. Professor Goldman, you and Pam both have something to add on this. Could you briefly add your comments so we can move on to Certainly. another topic as well? So just quickly, um, I think in terms of carve-outs, carve-outs make me nervous. There are unex unintended consequences of carve-outs. There tend to be. I think that a very important thing to do is to, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about various harms. Right now, there's not a unitary privacy test that is done before carve-outs. And I would love to see that involved. That being said, I think the way to handle some of these carve-outs is to implement voluntary consensus standards or some kind of process that will identify all of the stakeholders, all of them in any ecosystem, and find a way to start having discussions that do not incur um, legal problems, et cetera, et cetera, but which can work towards solutions. Nothing has to be perfect. And the way that the voluntary consensus standards have worked in other sectors is that you don't have to adopt the standard. It's not a Swiss cheese. The standard is there if you want to adopt it and get the benefits of that. If you don't want to adopt it, then things will be as they were. I think this is a better approach than just simply taking out a scalpel. Professor Goldman? It's tricky to distinguish between large and uh, small players on the internet for two reasons. One, we have a number of small that are among the top 15 um, services um, in the country. So for example, services like Craigslist or Wikipedia or Reddit actually have very small staffs um, but have very large footprint. On the flip side, we have a lot of a number of large companies that have a small presence in user generated content. And so you could easily trip the threshold where they're going to meet look like big companies, but they're actually not that invested in uh, in uh, user generated content and therefore would be, then be hit with all the obligations that would be applicable to someone who had a bigger footprint. So um, I, I think the, the concept of carving between small and big uh, services is great. How it actually translates to the internet is I think trickier than maybe other industries. So in the interest of time, let's move on to the question of speech, which I know and the value of speech, which a lot of people are interested in. And there's a wide spectrum of views on how Dirty impacts the, the quantity and the quality of speech. And, and David, maybe we could start with you, and you could talk a little bit about your view of, of how Section 230 affect, affects the speech question. Yeah, it's um, certainly a complicated one because a lot of the things we have been talked about today and have been complained about are a speech we don't like, that, but it's not necessarily illegal or actionable in other respects. Um, a couple things I'd note. First of all, again, I'll cede no ground to anybody in the free speech debate. But the off-use phrase is actually pretty accurate. Freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. Uh, somebody gets to speak, uh, and another company decides how, who gets heard by that speech. And by the way, that's, that's a second decision. That's different than decision to speak. Uh, and uh, there's no there's no inherent problem with asking somebody to be uh, accountable for that decision they make about who who gets to see that speech. Uh, that is, uh, a, again, a separate act. As is, by the way, all the commercial decisions around what kind of content you get to see. I mean, it, it's it, it's sort of um, very esoteric. Well, it's not the speakers; they're just the intermediaries. But what they're doing is they're we're looking at a vast amount of uh, of content, and then they get to decide what you get to see. So that's a separate act for which, again, they should have accountability. It's, it's actually very similar to what a publisher or editor does with journalism, right? There's somebody who creates the content, and they then decide how it, how it uh, is reflected in their product. So again, I, and frankly, I'm not even I'm not mad or have any problem with folks making good commercial decisions, but it's a weird idea that they get to make good commercial decisions that help their product for which they then don't have, have this broad exemption. Uh, you know, there aren't many other businesses like that, uh, that that get that. And I've represented a lot of different industries, and this idea that you need this broad exemption from your commercial activity in order to survive is, is a weird one and ultimately unsustainable. I just got to tell you, it's not going to be a way that this develops over time because it, it doesn't incentivize good decision making. I Julie, would you like respond to respond to that? Um, and I think that that is a, um, you know, when you 
compelling case. You know, and I think that a lot of people hear that and immediately agree, but I think what that ends up looking like in practice, the experience of being on the internet would be so fundamentally different. And we haven't really talked about it, we have a little bit, but it's hard to talk about from the pure kind of consumer experience of the internet user. And, you know, if, if these platforms weren't making some of those decisions, the, the experience would be just like total chaos, right? And, and the experience of going to read a social network, for instance, would be um, one that, that wouldn't get used. Now, we can talk about incentivizing, and, and I think that, that is slightly different than what I'm saying, but there is also a real kind of impact on the user. And it's kind of what I said at the outset that I think is so important here, this idea of you know, Neil, what you talked about your experience with your daughter. Um, there are so many other movements, so many social movements. I'm not going to go through the laundry list. We're running out of time. But people are using these platforms to connect in incredible ways that are changing society. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be having the conversation we're having today. But I, I think it's so... Um, important that we have the conversation in the context not just of what the platform's responsibilities are, but what the end users are gaining and how they're connecting as well. Mr. Goldman, you described it as a balance. Can you talk a little bit about the balance between preventing harms and protecting speech? How is that achieved? And one of the principles I know that you've signed on to talks about not disincentivizing platforms from addressing objectionable content. Yeah. But for many of the problems that we've been talking about, Section 230 will ultimately be the solution. It's not the source of the problem. The source of the problem is the way we interact with each other as humans. And Section 230 is the, the, the enabler of the development of tools to do better than that. Um, I thought that the prior panel's discussion about GAB was pretty insightful. Um, that uh, if we think that there's a harm out there that we want redress, that, that the Section 230 enabled a bunch of services to take action um, uh, to solve that. Now, notice the balance. There are a bunch of people on GAB, users of GAB, whose conversation were chilled by that intervention. It's, no one's going to get something for free here. So the question is, how are we going to uh, decide that? One of the best things about Section 230 is it enables the diversity of editorial practices so that we all don't look like the traditional media publication process. It actually has enabled the, uh, the development of different ways for us to con converse with each other, for us to develop and generate and share content in ways that we never saw in the offline world. That diversity is actually part of the solution to the problem, letting us find the communities where we can best understand each other and allowing editorial practices that allow us to have the conversation we need to have. I think about Neil's clubbed foot example. I do not understand what that community needs. It would be, it would be uh, hubris of the first order, and that's coming from a law professor, um, <laughs> to think that I, could di di that I could dictate how a community like that is going to develop from a top-down approach. But if we allow the diversity of editorial practices, we can have the Clubfoot community and we can have the tightly controlled communities like the News Media Alliance is going to adopt and everything in between. And that happens, quote, by magic. I didn't realize unfortunately, I was adopting anything. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a quick um, comment? Yeah, quick comment, and unfortunately, we're we're almost at one o'clock, yeah. and we might we might have a revolt if we keep going. I, I know it. Longer. I see it. Um, I, I think that your your comments, Eric, are really point to the need for additional research and fact patterning in this space. They're well taken. Um, I something I have not heard today is anything about predictive speech. And I think this is an, uh, an issue that's coming up. We've all talked about um, today throughout these panels on how the world is changing. I think that's correct. We're coming from the internet as a general purpose technology for the past 25 years and from an era of 25 years of digitization. And now we're moving into an era of prediction. That means we'll have predictive speech. It's already started. Um, and I just think that that is going to be a very complex topic. That will be uh, the topic for another panel coming soon. <laughs> Well, um, let me uh, just say thank you to our panelists, and please, please join me in giving them a round of applause. Uh, and before we break, I think we're going to have a few, few uh, comments. Um, not from us, fortunately.
You're done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're done. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're done. Hey, be before we leave, um, just one moment. We're going to have some closing remarks. Do not worry about your lunch. These are very brief closing remarks. I, I just want to thank you on behalf of the department, both to our and to our, um, our attendees, for coming to this important discussion about the sort of future and the merits and the scope of Section 230. I think it's a, a worthy um, contribution to the ongoing debate. Um, and just maybe we could give one more hand to our, all our panelists today. <laughs>